Good afternoon to everyone here in the United States and good evening to those of you joining us from Europe. My name is Jörn Fleck and I'm the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to day one of the Atlantic Council's Central Europe Week, our annual series celebrating relations between the United States and Central Europe. Our program this week will explore how the United States and Central Europe can together lead in shaping transatlantic responses to regional and global challenges. We are hosting this year's iteration of Central Europe Week within a fundamentally different geopolitical and security context. It has been nearly 10 months since, this, since Russia invaded Ukraine. Since its start, Russia's unjustified and unprovoked war has undermined the principles of the international order changed the face of European politics and forced the transatlantic alliance to reassess its security and defense posture. Our allies in Central Europe, with their long history with and geographic pro proximity to Russia, have been sounding the alarm for well over a decade on Putin's revisionist ambitions in Europe. They warned of the long-term consequences of economic and energy dependence on Russia. As of February 24, no one can ignore that alarm and those warnings any longer. Since the invasion, we've witnessed unprecedented unity within NATO and the European Union and a clear realization of the threat posed by Moscow. We've also seen our Central European allies step up in significant ways in responding to Russia's war. Yet as we continue to stand up to Putin and maintain our robust support for Ukraine, we must also fundamentally rethink our shared defense, economic, and energy policies for the future. I hope that with today's kickoff event focused on our collective security and the future of NATO, we can help drive forward this conversation and start an exciting series of debates. Throughout the week, we aim to highlight key voices from Central Europe and consider opportunities and a positive agenda for transatlantic cooperation in the digital energy and infrastructure sectors as well. In parallel, we will host an engaging social media campaign to emphasize US Central European connections and share more perspectives from the region. We hope you will join this campaign via Twitter by following at AC Europe and using the hashtag Central Europe Week. Before I turn it over for our opening keynote remarks, I'd like to thank our partners who have helped us organize what promises to be a fascinating and timely event. Specifically, I'd like to thank the Embassy of the Czech Republic in Washington, D.C., the Jagello 2000 Association, and the Konrad Adenauer Foundation for their partnership. I would also like to thank my team at the Europe Center for their efforts in organizing this week's incredible program along with our colleagues across the council who've been instrumental in delivering this conference, including our executive office, our events team, technical team, and experts from across the 16 programs and centers. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion and that you will tune in over the course of the week. And now I'm delighted to welcome our president and CEO, Fred Kemp, for opening remarks. Thank you all again for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. It's a pleasure to be joined by such a wonderful group of policymakers and experts uh, this afternoon as we kick off our 2022 Central Europe Week with today's event celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Prague NATO Summit. Uh, I want to start by first thanking our partners at the Embassy of the Czech Republic, the Galo 2000 Association, and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for their help in organizing uh, today's important event. This year's Central Europe Week uh, conference comes at a significant moment for the region and for the Transatlantic Alliance. 2022 marks 20 years since the historic Prague Summit, which I'm proud to have attended, uh, and that summit fundamentally altered uh, the transatlantic security picture. Today, we are witnessing the same security arrangement being challenged again by Russia's illegal war in Ukraine. The transatlantic alliance has been repeatedly tested by Russia's criminal acts of aggression. The atrocities committed in Ukraine, the nuclear saber rattling, the energy blackmail from the Kremlin, 
have made the stakes for Europe abundantly clear. Few better understand this than our allies from Central Europe, who of course have the greatest proximity to the problem. A prescient 2008 quote from President Václav Havel, who was also instrumental to the success of the Prague summit, hammers home the point. Quote, I think that after many centuries, there is a kind of Russian problem that Russia doesn't know exactly where it begins and where it ends. The Czechs know well that democracies must unite and face threats from aggressive dictators. That was true in the 20th century, and it remains so today. Since Putin attacked Ukraine, uh, the transatlantic alliance has remained strong and unified on Russia, rising to meet the challenge by sending uh, billions of dollars in military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, reducing dependence on Russian oil and gas across Europe, and welcoming millions of Ukrainian refugees. Europe has had to adopt robust changes since Russia's war in Ukraine started, and we're not done yet. Together, we are reimagining European security, economic, and energy policies for the better. In the long term, however, questions remain about how European security will continue to evolve to meet the current geopolitical moment. It's in this context that we have gathered today to consider the legacies of the Prague Summit and to discuss the further development of Euro-Atlantic security to meet both today's and tomorrow's challenges. And with that, I am delighted to welcome Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jan Lepofsky, for his keynote, keynote remarks. Minister Lepofsky has been among the most vocal advocates for Ukraine during Russia's brutal invasion and for European unity and a countering of China's malign influence in Europe long before that. The Czech government, through its presidency of the EU, has also been instrumental in marshalling support for Ukraine and keeping the alliance working closely together while taking significant steps toward building a more resilient Europe. We're honored to hear from you, Mr. Minister, and I thank you as well, uh, I, th I thank you as well as our audience again for joining us. Thank you. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to address this year's Central Europe Week devoted to our strong transatlantic bond in the wake of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. Let me first express my gratitude to the Atlantic Council for holding this event and promoting the Central European perspective to audiences on both sides of the Atlantic. It is not just the geographic proximity that has driven Central European countries' determined response to the war in Ukraine. Our resolve is equally reinforced by our own bitter experience with the Kremlin's aggressive imperialism. Our historical experience is a powerful source of empathy, which is a critical enable of our bold policies. Russia's war aims to not only destroy Ukraine, but to oppose the democratic West and degrade our values as well. We share a responsibility to protect our vision of the international order based on the fundamental principles forged on the ashes of the Second World War. As the war in Ukraine drags on, it becomes increasingly important that we emphasize to our own people the just cause for our action and not let the spread of hostile narratives erode our unity and resolve. This requires both diligent work at home as well as persistent outreach and communication with our allies and partners. Czechia has held the EU presidency in a decisive period for the EU and for Europe as a whole. I'm proud that facing the unprecedented challenge, the EU's response has exceeded expectations of both external and internal spectators. The epic failure of Russia's malign activities and blackmail exposed the deep miscalculation the Kremlin made about its ability to divide Europeans and suppress our readiness for action. We are witnessing a gradual shift in the EU towards assuming a stronger geopolitical role. It is critical that this transformation goes hand in hand with fostering the transatlantic bond with the United States and in close cooperation with NATO. In the current crisis, we all have learned important lessons. 
in the most graphic manner, it is apparent that the peace in Europe cannot be taken for granted and that we need to invest in our defences in the long run. It includes meeting the formal NATO defence spending commitment as well as providing our armoured forces the long-term perspective that they need to build effective fighting forces and acquire modern equipment. In addition, we must collectively cope with the energy crisis. It is clear that we underestimated the need for diversification and allowed for dependency on Russia, an unreliable source, despite all the warning signs in previous decades. Unhealthy and unsustainable dependencies have emerged in global supply chains and in the semiconductor industry as well. Resilience, once an abstract buzzword for security policy geeks, now represents an important paradigm. We need to take it into account in evaluating investment, trade and technology opportunities with possible security ramifications. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, let me summarize what I see as our main agenda of the transatlantic relationship in the months and years to come. We must ensure that NATO remains united and steadfastly focused on its primary mission of collective defense with a global outlook in the era of strategic competition. We must encourage a direct EU-US security dialogue, including foreign policy coordination, and deepen the NATO-EU cooperation, including on outreach to third countries affected by Russian and Chinese propaganda and coercive practices. We must continue to promote and make good use of EU-US Trade and Technology Council. It is a crucial tool at hand to foster and protect transatlantic economy, to strengthen open and fair trade, and to address global challenges. We should strive for avoiding unnecessary trade disputes that may weaken our collective response to major challenges. Our joint support to Ukraine must endure as long as it is needed until the full restoration of Ukraine's integrity and sovereignty within international recognized borders. We must hold Russia liable for war damages and responsible for the aggression of aggression it has committed in Ukraine. We have to act united against the assertive behavior of China in cooperation with our partner democracies in the Indo-Pacific region. The challenge China represents for our rules-based order is the same for the United States as for the EU. And above all, as the cornerstone of our efforts stands the need to maintain unwavering unity across the Atlantic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister, and welcome everyone to panel number one. We have a very distinguished lineup for this panel. The panel is entitled 20 Years Since Prague, Lessons and Opportunities for the Future of Transatlantic Security Cooperation. I'm Paula Dobriansky. I'm on the board of the Atlantic Council and also the vice chair of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Let me briefly introduce our very distinguished panel. I'm going to also introduce them in the lineup in which I'm going to pose the first question. So first, uh, let me introduce and welcome uh, Minister Alexandra, known as also Sasha Bondra, former Czech Minister of Defense and Foreign Minister. Welcome to you. We're very delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have Ambassador Alexander uh, uh, Virschbau, I was going to say also, better known as Sandy Virschbau. Or, or Sasha. <laughs> or, okay, or Sasha here, who uh, is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, but most significantly and relevant to this topic. Well, you were former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, and you were also former Deputy Secretary General of NATO. We will hear from Sally Painter, also welcome to you, <clears throat> co-founder and chief operating officer of Blue Star Strategies, someone who has traveled very widely and throughout Central and Eastern Europe. And then we have uh, Dr. Stephen Flanagan, welcome to you, adjunct senior fellow at the Rand Corporation and someone who's had <clears throat> a very distinguished career in, uh, in government and dealing with this area. So, Minister, let me go to you first. The first question is, we're 20 years out. What have been the opportunities and what have been the challenges relative to NATO, NATO cooperation? Where are we now? Take a look at the past and come forward. 
Well, 20 years ago, the key challenge was to fix uh, Central and Eastern Europe in the security term. And I think that uh, we succeeded in this. Uh, look, you know, Prague uh, NATO <laughs> summit, for example, welcomed the Baltic states in, in NATO. I just try to imagine that, you know, Baltic state without the NATO commitments facing now this kind of a brutal, uh, assertive uh, Putin's policy. You know, they are safe now. They would not be safe without NATO. The same goes with Romania. So 20 years ago, we were harvesting, I think, uh, on uh, the beauty of the second Clinton term, on f the beauty of the first uh, George W. Bush uh, first term. Uh, we were harvesting uh, on the excellent bi uh, bipartisan cooperation here in the United States, something you know, can you now just dream about. Uh, we could harvest. Uh, uh, because the community of those who were shaping uh, the decision in the background, you know, were all dedicated Atlanticists on the both sides of, uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to see again Sandy Vergebaugh, Sally Painter, uh, uh, Steve Len again, you, uh, Paula. So you were all the part of this huge uh, company. We were, you know, it's an era of the World Cup now, everybody watching football. So, you know, we were playing like a Brazil uh, <laughs> football team, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we also had uh, strongly committed uh, Atlanticists among the Central and Eastern Europeans. So uh, that uh, was, I would say, the end of a decade, which was very productive in which the West in general, so both the United States, Western Europe, Central and Eastern Europe were uh, able to set the global agenda and were able to pursue uh, the road to achieve the goals which uh, uh, we set up ahead of us. So for me, it's a great memory and, uh, you know, all those who contributed this should be blessed today because we are now swimming in much more uncertain waters and uh, due to what we have achieved uh, 20 years ago, at least we can be more relaxed, uh, or not relaxed, maybe it's not a good word, but at least certain with some issues uh, in the time of uncertainty. And it's, I think it's a lot. Well, I think it's good to memorialize it, and that's what we, in fact, are doing today. But having said that, um, Sandy, if I may uh, refer to you as Sandy, um, uh, how do you see it in this case, uh, the opportunities? But delve into, aren't there a few challenges that we're confronting, mm, too? Well, a few. <laughs> <laughs> talked about the waters, the shark-infested waters, particularly since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But I look back at the uh, Prague summit uh, as not only a, a great achievement in bringing all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe into the NATO alliance, it was a fairly daring move at the, at the time. The so-called Big Bang started out as the least popular option, particularly among European allies who didn't want to uh, take on so many new members who might not be as politically reliable as, uh, as the first three that we took in 1997. Uh, but, but also there was this concern about uh, antagonizing the Russians. But I think what, what struck me looking back at the, uh, the, the documents from the summit and some of the surrounding rhetoric. We had the right paradigm at that time in building an inclusive European security system, which had a place for Russia, uh, had a place for partnerships with uh, like-minded countries in other parts of the world. Uh, it really was a, a summit that started the process of transformation, or continued the process of transforming NATO from its uh, Cold War uh, identity to uh, an alliance that's dealing with the new threats, the emerging challenges. And so in that sense, it was a good example of the kind of uh, NATO that we still need today. But, but on the Russia side, I, I was struck by how the paradigm that had been adopted by the Clinton administration of having a two-track approach in expanding NATO for the countries that, uh, that qualify and a strategic partnership with Russia, we were still pursuing that very same paradigm. There, in fact, was a NATO-Russia summit earlier in the year just as we had had a, the signing of the Founding Act prior to the Madrid summit, which started the ball rolling. And I think that uh, it was the right approach 
and it belies some of the ret retroactive criticisms that we still hear, particularly from the Russians, about the expansion of NATO being at the root of all the problems that we face today. I think we, we made a good faith effort. There were eff a lot of areas where we sought to work with the Russians. We established the NATO-Russia Council to, to, to talk to each other as equals. Uh, I, I can't see, we'll talk about later, but I can't see going back to that without some fundamental changes in Russia. But I think it's important to remember that uh, this wasn't directed against Russia. It was part of an inclusive strategy uh, relating to the transformation of NATO. We did erase the, uh, the dividing lines. No more Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. No more uh, Yalta. Uh, but we did it in a way that showed that this was aimed at including Russia in a, in a common European security system. By the way, I'd just like to add this. Um, because this question comes up a lot uh, about you know, Russia and how Russia was treated or not treated, I think it's worth noting in this administration, Secretary Blinken devoted a full press conference actually to that question and literally documented mm -hmm. everything you've said and even more and reminding people of what actually transpired. And so I'm glad you started off yeah. that way. Thank you for that. We're going to come back to yeah. you on that. Uh, was Ambassador Russia watching enviously as the <laughs> Prague summit was unfolding. Yes. But that's what, what struck me from my perch in Moscow. Indeed. Sally, you were there on the scene. And yeah. so I don't know if you want to say a word about that. But you were actually there at the uh, Prague Summit, if you'd like to uh, speak to it, but also this question of opportunities and challenges. Sure. Well, let me start. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure, Ambassador Dobyansky, to be here. And I want to thank Dan Fried for the invitation and the Atlantic Council and the Czech Embassy and Jan Hronik for inviting me as well. And a special thank you to Sasha, uh, as he hired me to work the summit and work with President Havel. And it was really one of the proudest moments of my life. So what I'd like to do is just to take maybe four lessons learned. At 20 years out, we would never have realized that that was the high point, right? We thought it was the beginning of another 20 years of great success. And when I think about what it is we were able to achieve, and Sasha and Sandy touched on it, but let me just talk about four lessons. There were those of us here, and I'm going to say from Washington, who we had a vision. It was about a new policy. It was a strong transatlantic alliance. And we were going to be bold. Um, without a vision, the Prague Summit would not have worked. Um, we wanted to be, have Europe whole and free. And we wanted to have a major expansion of seven countries. You talked about the Big Bang. No way were we going to uh, cross the Molotov-Ribbentrop line. The Baltics were never going to be in. Russia said they were going to invade Poland. But we said, no, every day we are going to counter conventional wisdom. We're not going to be worried about kicking the bear. We're not going to go slow. Um, we also heard that these countries weren't ready. We're hearing some of those same things today. Um, they weren't ready. We don't need an invitation. Um, but we, as a very small bipartisan community, said, no, we're going to be bold and we're going to fulfill our vision. I think the second important point we learned from a successful Prague Summit is leadership matters. One person can make a difference. And we had a core group of bipartisan people in Washington who said we're going to make it happen, as many Democrats as Republicans. While we had President uh, Clinton and President uh, Bush who were supportive, really at one point in time, and I remember being with you in uh, Slovakia and Bratislava, when Václav Havel said, and Madeleine Albright said, we're going to go bold, and it's OK to have the bolts in. And at that moment, things changed. It was, it was really leadership. The second point about leadership is we knew to get something passed in Washington, you needed to have an advocacy group. So we created something that, as you said, Sasha, would probably not be created. It's called something called the US Committee on NATO, made up of bipartisan citizens who worked every day to promote this agenda. And we lobbied. And we lobbied the private sector corporations. We lobbied the Jewish community. We lobbied labor unions. We lobbied the diaspora. But we worked together on that common vision, and we did not allow people to stop us. Third lesson, and I think this in today's time is probably the most important, don't waste a crisis. Today, just like in 2002, policy experts said it was not the time, but we knew we had a limited time to uh, enlarge NATO and a, a very limited window. Um, we wanted to get in as many as quickly as possible because we knew that that time was going to change. 
I think the unintended consequences of the terrorist attack in September 11th really gave us that impetus because the U.S. was looking for more allies, particularly the Balts in Romania and Bulgaria, because we knew working together we could solve some of these situations. So we took advantage of a crisis, and I think we need to think about that today. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I, I really feel strongly about this, particularly those that said we made a mistake, we, we alienated Russia. We didn't. Um, but we also realized that by bringing these countries in, they have made us stronger. They have proven that by bringing them in, they have strengthened our uh, collective security. And when you look at the countries we brought in, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia, we are a much, much better alliance for today. So Great. that would be my lessons learned, phase one. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Uh, Dr. Flanagan, Steve, if I may, um, let's hear your perspective on this. Opportunities and challenges. How do you see it? Well, looking back, uh, I think that there's no doubt about it. As a number of my colleagues already said, the, the Prague Summit was transformative in several different ways. Not only did it give new members, new partners, but it also gave new capabilities. And I really, as someone who focuses a lot on hard security issues, I want to focus on those capabilities. And there were two, dealing with counterterrorism and dealing with the long-term defense of the Euro-Atlantic region, which has become even more urgent and critical, as, as both the minister and other speakers have noted today. So, of course, coming 14 months after the attacks of, uh, on the United States during 9-11, uh, it was only natural that, uh, that this summit had to address in an important way what was NATO going to do more concretely about dealing with the threat of global terrorism. And NATO did step up to that uh, challenge. It, uh, despite some disagreements over the approach to countering terrorism, what NATO's proper role should be, uh, the Allies agreed to a, a, a military concept for defense against terrorism. Uh, they uh, approved a package of measures to strengthen NATO's capabilities in that area. Uh, and also called for improvements in civil emergency planning, which, while they were focused at that time on the risk of weapons of mass destruction attacks or other kinds of terrorist actions, also provided an important basis for what we're talking about a lot today is enhancing national resilience to be able to resist uh, both hybrid and, and more robust attacks by a major power. Um, so these measures have all been incrementally improved. This, this really set the foundation, as Sandy said earlier, for a transformation of NATO for the 21st century. So that was an important. And all of these were just reaffirmed in the role of NATO and in, in the importance of countering terrorism as a NATO core task, or a core, not, not necessarily a core uh, task in the NATO parlance, but, but certainly a, a central mission in the 360 strategy. The second thing was it did create the NATO response force. Um, and well, uh, that was a, is an effort to try to reflect that NATO needed a new military capability to deal with uh, emerging security challenges and respond quickly. Uh, and that set the groundwork for further enhancements of NATO's ability to, uh, to defend uh, its territory against any further threats, which at that time were not looming. But fortunately, they did set the stage then later in 2014 for the readiness action plan for the development of the very high readiness task force, all of the kinds of military capabilities that have now come to fruition and the planning that allowed NATO to respond so quickly uh, in those first three months after the uh, Russian uh, attack on Ukraine to enhance the forward presence uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Perfect. Uh, you've added another dimension that we haven't discussed here, and I think a very critical one. So thank you for that. Minister, let me come back to you. Let's t take a spotlight on Central Eastern Europe. As a result of all of this, how has the leadership role of the region itself been expanded? Where do you see it's been and where is it going? Would you say that it certainly has been expanded? I mean, we're hearing the comments of the, the contributions. It would be good to hear your perspective on that. First of all, we are normal, standard, Western European country now. <laughs> well, Republic, I'm so singling we you out. So, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, it's important because, you know, we have the memory of living uh, 40 years under this communist Soviet uh, uh, occupation. So uh, for years, 40 years means two generations. So it's, it's just told my friends today that this year maybe the level of the Czech investments in the U.S. most likely would end number of the American investment in my country. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's uh, back to your question. Um, I think that we showed the leadership, a lot of leadership, just uh, immediately after the Russian invasion uh, into, into the Ukraine. 
Uh, first of all, I think many Czechs were moved by what, you know, after many years of certain Ukrainian fatigue. We, we suddenly listened to this famous statement by President Zelensky when he had his offer from Washington to use the train to freedom. He said, no train, I need the guns. And you know, for the Czechs, you know, with their experience from 1938 when we were facing the Nazi Germany invasion, and then 1968 we uh, faced the Russian or Soviet invasion, and uh, you know, we did not fight. Of course, the conditions were even worse than now, but now, you know, I personally was very moved by, by that, and Look, I think it was due to the Polish, Czech, Baltic states uh, who showed the others that we need to help them, to support them. We were the first who provided them the political support. We were the first who donated them the guns, including tanks, artilleries. Then, of course, we were very glad that the US, UK, uh, and Germany later on has full out. Uh, now we are pushing for uh, the Europeans for more economic aid because they, that would be deadly needed for, for the reconstruction in the Ukraine. So yes, I think Europe look um, got somehow weaker with unfortunate Brexit because we, we have lost one of the security pillars in the community, unfortunately, and uh, France and Germany, is, you know, they are not strong enough to, to, to lead. So, I think that now is the situation then the countries like in the you know north south axis you know from Sweden via Poland to Czech Republic maybe even to Italy now would provide uh, more support for uh, for atlanticism would provide the support for uh, anchoring the Ukraine too so uh, yes I think that uh, we are players now and just remind me I would remind by one thing uh, Peter Fiala, the Czech Prime Minister, together with uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki uh, from Poland and Prime Minister Jancza from Slovenia, they were the first to visit uh, Zelensky in Kiev when Kiev was under the siege uh, in early February of this year, you know. And it took a courage to go there mm -hmm. because, you know, mm -hmm. look, <laughs> Kiev was bombed the same evening when they were sitting and negotiating there. So I think that uh, we are doing what, what we can. All right, excellent. Um, Sally and Steve, would you like to, on that question, add anything further before I go to Sandy about Russia? I, I would just, you know, when, when Sasha says we're not worried about those countries, they've, they have transformed. They are vibrant economies. And I think for my, I was just there recently, they, they're stepping up and they want to do it. And it is, it's not something not to forget that we're not worried about them as democracies. We may not like all the elections, but they're, they're, they're doing their job. And I think that we can't discount the experience and the transformation that they had. And by them stepping up, they can really help the Ukrainians. They know what it feels like. So I was just talking about he can relate to it. And I think we need to give them the space and the support to actually help. Okay. Steve? No, I think the Central East Europeans have served somewhat as the conscience of NATO in the midst of all this crisis, uh, in further encouraging and, and, uh, and stimulating a, a more robust response to the Russian aggression. And I think that has shown that their voices, uh, and they didn't, and I, I think they approached this not with their hair on fire, as they were oftentimes criticized by some <laughs> in the West, but rather uh, in a very serious and steady way. If you look at the, some of the statements that were made early on by the Baltic prime ministers and others uh, about what NATO should be looking to do, uh, at the same time noting that uh, you know there was some need to be you know to open avenues for some kind of resolution of the conflict down the road. Uh, I, I think that that really shows the kind of maturity that these countries have shown and, and the leadership that they continue to play in, in uh, countering Russian aggression. Yep, absolutely. Well, let me just add, sure. add you know, and yes. when you think of the solidarity of the sanctions and the Baltic nations and that they're willing to take the cold and, you know, to take the hard decisions because they understand the latter. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're ready to fight it. And I think that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. And they pay a higher economic price than some of the allies that yeah. are complaining about the sanctions. Right. And they, take, they do that willingly. And also listening to Minister Lepofsky and the agenda that he laid out. It's a very robust agenda, mm -hmm. I have to say. Sandy, let's come back to you and mm -hmm. Russia, the issue about Russia and the relationship. Uh, NATO, uh, clearly with the invasion of Ukraine and what one is confronting, 
I mean, the question is, what kind of relationship can we have now with Russia? Yeah, right now it's hard to envisage any kind of cooperative relationship with Russia, uh, particularly as long as Putin is, is in power, obsessed with Ukraine, trying to erase it from the map, uh, erase Ukrainian national identity. The differences are so fundamental, and uh, the Russian defiance and mendacity underpinning their policy is, is so strong that uh, we have to think about you know, how can we influence the next generation and maybe create conditions you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now in which it becomes possible again to at least have a constructive civil dialogue with Russia. And perhaps the Russian people by that time will be demanding leaders who are more interested in integration with the West than clearly Putin ever will be again. It, it's, it's sad because when Putin came into power, we talked about his European choice, and then our, the strategy of the Bush administration was to cement his European choice. Uh, he was quite enthusiastic about the, uh, the summit in, in Rome in 2002, creating a more uh, dynamic framework for NATO-Russia cooperation. So uh, clearly what, what I think turned Putin against cooperation with NATO wasn't uh, enlargement. That passed rather quietly. Uh, in 2002 and 2004 when the actual accession of the, of the, the Big Bang seven countries took place. Uh, and uh, it, it looked to us that he, 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 the, he had a pragmatic side. You know, he, clearly he had his, his KGB background, but he was interested in uh, becoming part of a, a wider community. It was the, uh, not NATO enlargement, but the uh, color revolutions he became convinced that we were trying to uh, tear the countries from the periphery, the former Soviet republics, from Russia. And uh, that, that became so deeply in, in embedded in his psyche that it became impossible to keep the, the relationship going. Let me ask you, take it one step further and just uh, stick with you for a moment. Uh, after Ukraine wins the war, what kind of relationship should we be seeking with Russia? Well, I think we should signal that we would be prepared to have a more normal relationship when Russia comes back into compliance with all the different principles and commitments that it's flagrantly violated. Um, but any, any effort to restart uh, security cooperation would be, I think, a, a non-starter including for our own publics. And I think we would hear the strong voices from Central and Eastern Europe that uh, we, we can't repeat the mistakes of the past and going back to business as usual without demanding genuine fundamental change in Russian behavior. I don't think that's possible as long as Putin's still in power. And many of the likely successors to Putin may be equally unreconstructed anti-Western people. They may, be, they may be less obsessed with Ukraine. Uh, so it may take a generational change but I think change will come eventually because Russia is ruining its own future with this invasion. And sooner or later, the Russian people will demand a, a better uh, policy from their leaders. Okay, thank you for that. Sasha, what about that? How do you see it? Do you agree with what Sandy has said here about the relationship with Russia? Do you see it differently? Uh, well, more or less, yes. Look, I think, first of all, if somebody blame us, you know, that uh, you know we let the Russian into isolation and that... It's not true. Until 2008, you know, we were fully inclusive towards Russia. Russia had every opportunity mm -hmm. and chance to engage with us in a very fruitful cooperation. And in fact, uh, was engaged, you know, with the gas and all that uh, with Europe until the last moment. Uh, it was Putin who breached the, the, the rules of the game in 2008 with Georgia. In 2014 with the Ukraine first, and now finally with this massive invasion, unprovoked, unjustified by any means. So, look, I think that with Putin is impossible. He crossed all thinkable lines, but uh, Russia will stay where it is. I think we have no interest, you know, for for the disintegration of Russia and being you know, just a feat for China or whatever. Uh, not at all. Uh, I, I think that, uh, from my perspective, you know, unfortunately, this heydays of a global cooperation, uh, I think, are over. These heydays of low inflation world, which was feeded mm -hmm. by 
cheap Russian gas in, uh, in Europe and cheaper Chinese labor here, it's over to, for a long time, mm. for a long time. Uh, and somehow, you know, we are heading into a bit more multipolar world. It's maybe, you know, there's a Russia, there is a China, but uh, there's India, you know, you see how they are voting uh, in the UN, you know, all those folks. So, uh, but Russia will stay as it is. So, I think that one day we should be able to develop normal, standard relationship with them. And maybe not to repeat the mistake, you know, of the Versailles. Uh, <laughs> Germany led Europe into the First World War. But then, you know, I think some bitter decisions are ahead of us, but not with Putin. You know, mm -hmm. Putin yeah. simply breached every, uh, every rule of the game. So with him, I cannot imagine. But with his successor, to, 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 to restart some kind of a rational relationship, mm. not the alliance. I, I, you know, here I'm skeptical. Uh, I don't expect Russia to be a standard uh, Western country. I think that <laughs> Russia is a bit different, but we should have a rational relationship. But first, you know, we need to fix the problem with the Ukraine and it must gain, regain the independence. It must be protected. Should it be brought into NATO? Um, my answer is yes, uh, and look, uh, I think it will not be easy to find an agreement on that, <laughs> listening even the voices in the town, listening the voices in Europe. Uh, look, what we should definitely avoid is this answer maybe, because mm -hmm. it's the wrong, uh, the, it's the wrongest yeah. one. Either yes, and I would do it immediately because look, they are fighting, they are fighting, and if you want to alliance with the nation, so those who are willing to fight for freedom and independence, they are contributing more than those who are just, you know, <laughs> uh, refuse to fight. So it's a military alliance, and they proved that uh, they are worse of, of, of this. That's my deep conviction. Um, but of course, look, uh, we need also to keep the unity uh, inside the EU. This, the, one of the biggest achievements of the Czech presidency is that we have kept the unity in the EU now. And it's not easy, you know. We yeah. Look at Macron's statements after he has uh, left the White House, you know. Not talking about the security guarantees for Ukraine, but talking about some security guarantees for Russia. I don't understand why now he's raising this. But uh, we kept the unity uh, over the Atlantic. That's very important. I had a consultation on the Hill uh, last couple of days and noticed gladly that uh, on Ukraine we are... Uh, following the same, mm -hmm. uh, same uh, goals, and, and, and we are determined to continue in helping, including the military aid. Uh, but, you know, it will be harder after some time, <laughs> so Ukraine must, uh, must continue now. Steve, let me get your perspective on this issue of what role Central and Eastern Europe, and forgive me as I define it that way, but to single out the countries in this case, but Central and uh, 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 Central European countries, what role can they play post a Ukraine victory in uh, engaging Russia? How do you see it? Well, they are going to play a central role, as they already are in many cases, in providing security assistance and support to Ukraine over the longer term. And I, I think that uh, the. Uh, the whether it's it's hard right now to see what the path forward is to some kind of a settlement, uh, given the, the demands that Russia has made and the claims on territorial annexation, but that are completely unacceptable to Ukraine. But I think um, the uh, the International Committee on Security Assistance, Security Guarantees to Ukraine, that was led by uh, former Secretary General Rasmussen and Mr. Yermak, the Ukrainian presidential advisor, I think that has set forward a good path for how. Uh, we could uh, provide a guarantee of uh, strong security assistance and long-term training and exercises and support for Ukraine to enable them to continue along the lines that Sasha was just talking to, to defend their own territory and to uh, sort of continue the pathway, which NATO has just reaffirmed again at the most recent summit, that NATO uh, has not walked away from the commitment that Ukraine could one day join. I think right now it's, a long sh it's, it's hard to imagine the alliance reaching consensus to have Ukraine join anytime soon. But over time, if you had this relationship because of what Ukraine itself has proven in defending Western interest uh, over the last 10 months, uh, coupled with uh, the kind of relationships that might build if you went down this path that the Kyiv Security Compact has laid out, then I think you might see a, a, a gradual development of, of a stronger and stable Central and Eastern Europe that included Ukraine and perhaps Georgia over time. 
Uh, and that also would allow for then, perhaps ultimately, if there were this transformation of Russia that, that Sandy said we all had hoped for uh, back in the late 1990s, uh, that could lead to a, a new kind of European security order where Russia, uh, a less aggressive and uh, uh, more uh, uh, cooperative Russia, would, uh, would have a place. Okay, thank you. Sally, do you want to add anything to this? I think they've said it. Okay, well then, then I'm going to begin with you with a different question, and that's the open door policy and expansion. I mean, uh, as Sandy, when he made his, gave his response to the first question, you know, he, you reminded us about some of the challenges mm -hmm. at the time. Not everybody was supportive of that list, and I, I, I remember that very, very well. And there were lines drawn. Some people were in favor of expansion, some people were not in favor of expansion or limited expansion. Given the invasion of Ukraine, where are we today on the question of open door policy and expansion? I'm going to ask all of you that open question. Open door is a must. I think it's must. an important one. It's a must. And the lessons learned of what 2002 was that it was successful. And when <coughs> NATO faltered in 2008 in the Bucharest summit and the French and the Germans would not give MAP to Georgia and to Ukraine, three months later, Georgia uh, was invaded. It was a sign to Putin. He said, great. And what did we really do? We did not support Georgia 100%. We said, oh, well, maybe not. And then 2014, what did we do? We really didn't do anything. So I think open door is a must. And I do believe it's open door for Russia. But there is policies that they need to put in place. But that fundamental moment in 2008, I think, set forth the next 20 years. And so we, we must talk about open door, because that's what the alliance stands on. Sandy? Well, on, on the one hand, I fully agree we have to maintain the policy of the open door as part of the NATO founding treaty. But we also have to recognize the fact that besides Ukraine, which is clearly a capable, militarily capable uh, p potential ally, there aren't that many good candidates left, particularly with the admission of Finland and Sweden. So uh, we certainly have to encourage countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, maybe Moldova if they want to give up neutrality not to uh, abandon the hope for NATO membership. And I think we have to focus on what Ukraine needs right now. First of all, we need to help them defeat Russia. Because if we don't defeat Russia, uh, it just makes the world safe for further changing of borders by force and uh, violation of the territorial integrity of, of states. And, and China and other autocrats will get the, the, the wrong idea if, if Russia, Russia gets away with it. Uh, but I think beyond that, what, what Steve referred to as this uh, package of security guarantees, the Kiev Security Compact. I think that is how we have to deal with Ukraine in the short and medium term, because I don't think, as much as I would hope to see opinion change inside the alliance, I don't see actually Ukrainian membership in NATO being in the cards for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but even if we were to give them an Article 5 guarantee and bring them in as members, we'd still have to do this sort of arming, training, equipping mm -hmm. uh, that... Uh, sort of on the lines of how we support Israel uh, if Ukraine is going to deter Russia from invading a third time. Uh, paper guarantees clearly are not going to be enough. Do you have a view on Georgia? Well, I think they should be, continue to be encouraged. Uh, they, they've gone backwards in some of their commitments to a democratic principles, rule of law, and they don't seem to take our criticism seriously. So uh, they got a bit of a cold shower when the EU didn't give them the same candidate, candidate, candidate status as uh, Ukraine or Moldova. Uh, so we should encourage them, but they have some internal issues they're going to have to work out first. Right. Steve, let's hear from you, and then Sasha will come to you on this question. I associate myself with Ambassador Verspro's okay. uh, <laughs> pithy remarks. All right. So I, I, that was a very I think that's pithy answer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, Minister Sasha. No, look, I think that the open doors policy in general was a well designed, and 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 uh, we all benefited out of that. Uh, not just uh, we, the new members, but I think the West in general has benefited. Mm -hmm. And NATO itself. Uh, because look, to anchor Poland, I think it was one of the greatest achievements. That's look, a couple of weeks ago, when this uh, missile has landed in Poland accidentally, and mm -hmm. you know the Polish uh, matured, uh, cool, cool response. Mm -hmm. That was because okay. it's anchored into NATO. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those are the small accidents which can uh, result in a big, uh, big conflict. So um, 
or another example, we do have many problems with Turkey, but still it's much better to have Turkey in than to have Turkey out of NATO. Uh, because we still have a control over oh, the, the geopolitical development in the Eastern Mediterranean due to that. So from this perspective, I think the key country is uh, by far the Ukraine. And we need to find a solution here. We need to find a solution which would not go to the repetition of what we have seen this spring. Uh, because if, if there is this uh, repeated uh, Russian attempt, you know, to uh, reinstall the Russian empire, uh, empire to, to uh, and, and, you know, the detriment of the others, so then uh, we would have a huge problem. So there must be a clarity where Russia... <laughs> Uh, Václav Havel, one of the famous statements was, you know, the, the greatest problem of Russia is that he does not know where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, <laughs> there must be, you know, some uh, agreement when Russia ends. But you do... Know. But and then we can develop the, uh, a, a, a fruitful relationship sometimes in the future. But you do favor uh, the concept of keeping the opportunity for expansionism open, not just only in the country yeah, you mentioned, look, uh, but Yeah, but this general. question may be, you know, it's not... Uh, if you are playing with bastards, <laughs> and Putin is bastard, then, uh, you know, any kind of uncertainty can be exploited by the others. So, uh, you know... This may be one time, once time in the future. Uh, it's not the ideal design into those, uh, well, you know, I think it requires clear yes or clear no. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it could, I think, uh, you know, more and more I'm thinking about the Bucharest uh, Summit 2008 and this inability, you know, to reach the agreement between the United States yeah. on one hand and Germany and France on the other hand has resulted in this maybe. Yeah, and this may be, you know, was read in Moscow that, uh, you know, we need to act now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because to wait, it would be a mistake. So they did it immediately with regards to Georgia. It was after three months. And then once Putin has grown up, uh, he also challenged Ukraine. So, you know, the international relations don't like this, maybe. Mm -hmm. Career cut, yes, no. I'm going to go to, there's a question from Jean Mayer, and I'm going to go mm -hmm. to you with her quest, the question. Uh, a large number of Russians have left the country. How might they influence Russia? A government in exile would seem unlikely. <laughs> well, I think we need to engage with the uh, hundreds of thousands of Russians who have left, and uh, some of them are already well-known opposition figures, and I think the uh, opposition may set up shop outside of Russia because the repression inside Russia is so severe. So we should be engaging with the potential successor leaders who uh, may be among those uh, oppositionists in exile. And at the same time, we have to find ways using social media and other techniques to get to the younger generation in, inside Russia uh, who has to be getting disillusioned with what their fearless leader is uh, inflicting on the country. So you would uh, uh, agree that by being on the outside, they certainly can have some influence oh, uh, on those. Oh, Particularly with the Telegram and other uh, channels of communication. Okay. And just uh, given the moral stature of some of the figures involved, I think it's in our interest to, to, to help them without making them look like there are oppositionists, which would be like the kiss of death. Okay. <laughs> Steve, I'm going to go to you on this question of the Indo-Pacific and about China. Mm -hmm. And looking at NATO, there's been also quite a debate over what role NATO should or shouldn't have. How do you see it in this, uh, at, at this time? Uh, what should its role be? Stoltenberg made s comments very specifically uh, about the concern about the threats and the challenges posed by China. How would you define it today? Sure. Well, I think NATO has progressively recognized that China does pose a fundamental threat to the security interests of the alliance, not necessarily a military threat or the risk of armed aggression, but rather a threat to a number of other interests. And so I think it's important that the NATO allies, uh, working together with EU and other, other Western democracies that, that uh, believe in preserving some elements of the, the uh, international rule set and the, and the norms of behavior that uh, China is challenging to continue to work together 
I don't think the biggest contribution, the most important one, while France has a significant military presence in the Indo-Pacific, Britain has now decided under the recent integrated review to expand its military presence there a bit, but uh, I don't think that's the main contribution that they can make in the military sphere. Yes, occasional freedom of navigation activities to challenge China's territorial claims, other things may be helpful, but, uh, uh, but I think that the bigger role uh, is to stand together in other international fora in the, in the United Nations uh, in, the, um, in, in, the, uh, in dealing with uh, things like uh, law of the sea, other issues where uh, China is also trying to challenge some of our, our Western interests, uh, and to push back against the Chinese narrative that their, uh, their model of, of development and growth is, uh, is superior and that, uh, you know, questioning the, the, the weakness and decline of the West. So I think it's in that area of, uh, of protecting norms and, and continuing to, um, to support um, uh, Western efforts to, uh, uh, to push back against those areas where China, and of course, some of the particular areas where, where NATO does need to take, again, has agreed to do so on cyber defenses, on, uh, on other aspects of uh, one other important issue is, is how to deal with China in the Arctic. Uh, While well, Russia is being isolated right now, uh, it's in sort of uh, suspension, at more or less, of engagement with Russia in the Arctic Council. China it wants to play a larger role. Um, it, uh, it has some capacity to do so. Uh, it is challenging. Uh, uh, it, it's an observer in the Arctic Council, so it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic plays. It could. It, it could pivot to Russia and, and continue to pursue its uh, goals in the Arctic with Russia, or it might seek to play with the other members of the Arctic Council who will all soon be NATO members when Finland and Sweden join. So, uh, so I think there's a, it's, a, it's a complex uh, set of relations, but mostly uh, it's, it's more in the, in the political and, uh, and normative area that the European allies uh, can play the most important role. Uh, uh, and, and also continuing to take on greater burden in defense of Europe, which will allow the U.S and its process of rebalancing its military engagement towards the Indo-Pacific to, uh, to uh, pursue that without uh, greater risk to European security. Do all of you agree with that, uh, Minister? You were shaking your head. Uh, well, are you in agreement uh, with no, that? There is, China yes, has the loomed large in the Czech. developed its Indo-Pacific uh, policy, you know, somehow to respond to, to, to this. Uh, but it will not be easy, I guess, you know. Uh, a, the situation is getting harder, so, you know, this ambiguity, you know, when I was, you know, avoiding, you know, trying to avoid this Ukrainian ambiguity, there was the U.S. policy toward Taiwan, which was based on ambiguity. But I just noticed a couple of weeks ago some statement by President uh, Biden, which was departing for this neutral uh, ambiguity towards more more commitment. <laughs> uh, so even here you feel the same uh, same challenge, and then, you know, China. It brings me to Germany. You know, mm. the first crisis, 2008-9, Germany did not feel anything. You know, banking sector was in a good shape. Uh, but this crisis, it's being felt in Germany because they lost the cheap German gas, they lost the Russian market, and it undermines their export uh, competitiveness, uh, you know, this rising prices and, and the inflation. And you know, to cut off China economically, that would be a big challenge for, for the Germans. So I think it would require a lot of conversation now just to explain, I think, mutually over the Atlantic that, you know, the strategy is not necessary to, uh, to, to go into war with China, uh, that, you know, it's more duelists. And uh, it would require a really careful, I think, or carefully orchestrated transatlantic uh, dialogue to keep the unity, which I think is necessary and very important. Other comments on that? Yeah, Sandy, yeah I just please. wanted to endorse a point Steve made so briefly, people may have missed it. Uh, the, the idea that the European members of NATO need to start shouldering a much more substantial share of the burden for collective defense because of the China threat and the, and the possibility that in a, in a crisis in Europe, there may be a simultaneous crisis in Asia that would divert U.S. forces away from NATO, and Europeans need to be able to pick up the slack. Uh, and that means aiming to provide a much larger share of sort of the key capabilities and enablers than they're able to do now. The other thing I would say is, uh, in addition to whatever happens with the open door, I think developing a much more formal, robust framework for cooperation and consultation with the Asia-Pacific allies like Japan, Korea, Australia, something NATO should be doing to have kind of an extended family 
working on the, uh, the China threat and some of the other Indo-Pacific challenges that uh, we all face. By the way, uh, if I may, um, Jean Mayer came back with another question. Thank you, Jean, uh, for your additional question. The question focuses on the Russia-China, and in this case, the word uses alliance. So the Russia-China alliance, or potentially even with other Middle Eastern countries, what kind of impact is this having on NATO? Do you want to take a stab at well, that? I'll we can say a few things. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, Russia benefits from the support that it gets from China, but that re support may be uh, less open-ended than s seemed to be implied by the, uh, the joint declaration by Putin and Xi earlier this year. I think the Chinese in particular are, are worried about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, disrupting the global economy, adding to their self-induced problems. And uh, in particular, China seems to have leaned very hard, both privately and publicly, on Russian uh, nuclear threats. So uh, I think there's opportunities to, uh, for us, maybe not to drive a wedge between Russia and China, but to at least encourage China to distance itself a little bit and, and look for opportunities where we can work together. They may be few and far between. They're not the responsible stakeholder that we thought. Uh, but there may be still some specific areas where we can uh, uh, induce the Chinese to see things more our way than, uh, than the Russian way. Okay. Any other comments on that? Mm -hmm. Do you? Do you, oh, you <laughs> I, well, he, he's jumping in. No, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> go, go, ahead. I go ahead. Oh, go ahead, think Minister. Go ahead. No, and then we'll somehow hear. I still feel our interest is not to push uh, Xi Jinping and Putin into one corner, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> to keep them somehow split it. Uh, you know, five years ago, I was often thinking, you know, whether, you know, we are not coming to a kind of a reverse Kissinger <laughs> Meisterstich, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, when the West, and in particular U.S., has the Soviet Union challenge, so uh, they repeat somehow China. And if Putin is not an idiot, he would be thinking about uh, this. It would guarantee him uh, maybe an entirely different future. But, you know, Putin is an idiot and started this. And then, of course, uh, it's much uh, more difficult terrain. <laughs> Look, uh, I think that we still need to, to, to maneuver somehow to keep them somehow divided. We're witnessing the advantages of being out of government by your statements. <laughs> um, yeah, we parliamentarians can speak yes, freely. That's right. Um, Steve. Yeah, no, I, I think that, uh, and as, as Sandy said earlier, you know, this partnership without limits, as was declared by Xi Jinping and Putin earlier this year, is not, is, has been shown not to, to have some limits that the Russians, uh, the, 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 um, some of the Russian behavior has been uh, problematic for the Chinese. And I do think there are opportunities where, not that we can divide and conquer or that we can play some great game, uh, but I do think there are some areas of interest where Western interests and Chinese interests may be more aligned on some certain trade issues, on some uh, uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, dealing uh, with climate development of the Arctic I mentioned yeah. earlier. Right. Uh, that uh, that may be may be areas where we can uh, we can uh, ensure that that it doesn't turn into alliance. Even though, you know, they have been having these joint military exercises, including periodically, uh, you know, even a joint military exercise in the Baltic uh, Sea a few uh, about a, was it two years ago, uh, uh, you know that uh, and and most recently a, a China Russia exercise off the coast of Alaska, uh, uh, in, in the United States. So uh, I think it's it's not determined that it's heading in that direction. Uh, we could force it in that direction, depending upon the way we play it in the West. But uh, I, I think uh, it, it can, a more nuanced policy would be more effective. Okay. Sally, anything yes. you want to add briefly on that? Oh, as I say, NATO parlance, it's out of my area. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let me go to um, uh, kind of a final question. And then after asking you, uh, Minister, uh, uh, I want to give everyone else a chance to give a very quick closing uh, comment. But, and if you want to comment on this. I was struck by the fact that the German Chancellor, uh, Olaf Scholz, in Foreign Affairs, uh, he wrote an article in which he said, quote, uh, the world is facing a Zeitenwende, a, a tectonic shift. A Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has put an end to an era. Um, what does this mean for, for NATO uh, in this case? How do you see it a, going forward? A, I don't know, you know, uh, Chancellor Scholz was in Prague uh, at the early uh, September, had a big speech at Charles University, 
uh, about a one hour long. We listen more carefully and he uh, did not mention a word energy a single time, you know, it's totally omitted. So I, I don't de read this article. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but mentioned Germany a couple of times in in my remarks before. Uh, just you know, we need to take into account that this current crisis is uh, um, will 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 shape Germany much more than the previous one because uh, the the Germans will feel that the, the Germans will feel that they have the lack of energy. Uh, the, even you know this uh, energy when they, you know this reform of energy sector has been very much undermined uh, with, uh, with the cutting of the cheap uh, Russian gas. Uh, they gave up, and was just the in the era of hysteria after Fukushima, they gave up the nuclear energy. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a challenging time. You, you know, we all have to pay price for this. For example, heating bills. Just, I need to pay three times more than a year ago. Three times more. So. Just imagine that average Czech uh, family now has to pay not $200 per month, but $600 per month just for heating only. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we have much harder winter than, than you. In, in Berlin and Bavaria is the same situation. So uh, that can have some impact. And let's pray uh, and let's work together that uh, those impact would not be in a way that would have a distortive uh, uh, effect on, on the European Union and, and the transatlantic cooperation. Because, you know, not Russia, but China, for example, it will test our strengths working together, I, I, I think, uh, much more. Sally, let's uh, so, hear from you. You know, I, I, I marvel at this sometimes. We are doing so well. Putin misjudged that we would stay together as an alliance. We have stayed together as an alliance. We have stayed together on sanctions. They're working. I tried to kill Nord Stream 2 for four years. Putin killed it. It's gone, right? <laughs> we have two countries that just got into NATO, right? Or about to get into NATO, Finland and Sweden. When you think of the end, we've got 100,000 NATO troops on the border. Wow. Right? I mean, we are doing a lot, and it's, we're, we're being successful. Now, we have challenges ahead, but if you said a year ago that all of that would have happened, you're being crazy. Mm -hmm. I think we should focus, again, on what we've been able to do, what we've led on. We've got more to do. And I do think we should be open door, and I think we have to lead because we have to prove to other nations that there's something to work toward. Macedonia, 20 years. And when they want to get in fast, you can do it in a month or two if you're a Nordic. <laughs> anyway, right. I think we should focus on the positive because there's so much that's been achieved. We need the women in the politics. They, they <laughs> think positively, you know. <laughs> Sandy, would you like to say a few yeah, words? Yeah, I, I haven't read uh, the, the chancellor's article, but it sounds like it's an updated version of the speech that he gave right after the uh, invasion. Uh, and I think that uh, it's useful in hearing from the country that was so dependent on Russian energy, which made interdependence sort of a virtue rather than a vulnerability, uh, that they are kind of admitting the error of their ways. And uh, without, without uh, our Central European friends saying, we told you so, we told you so, we warned you over and over again since, uh, uh, since the Orange Revolution or, or, or the Georgian invasion. Mm. So, so I think that's a good thing. And uh, I think it's important that allies operate from a common assessment of the threats. And I think the fact that Germany is now kind of in the ma mainstream can be seen as a success of our Central European allies and sort of lifting the scales off of German eyes with a little help from Vladimir Putin and his invasion force. But I, I agree fully with Sally's point that uh, we are winning. We've, we've achieved enormous unity and success. And uh, this is, I think, confounding Putin. He, he, I think he really believed that we would fold. He may still believe that with the latest bombing of civilian infrastructure, that people are going to get uh, weary of continuing to support what they, Putin hopes to convince them is a lost cause. So we have to make sure that it isn't a lost cause and that uh, we continue to support Ukraine in, in all the different ways, particularly militarily, so that they defeat Putin and uh, we can go back to having a much more cooperative kind of Europe without a, a revisionist Russia undermining everything. And Steve. 
Yeah, I think the Zeitenwende is real both in Germany and throughout the whole alliance, and our colleagues have just enumerated all of those reasons how the alliance has hung together and how Germany has made such a remarkable trans transformation in its assessment of both its energy future and its defense requirements. The question is, is it sustainable? Will there be the will to stay through a couple of long, cold winters uh, if, in fact, uh, the, the war in Ukraine continues and sanctions continue to remain in place? Uh, and also, will there be the commitment to, to maintaining a more, uh, uh, you know, a, a continuing confrontation with Russia uh, at a time that will require additional spending with inflation running high in a number of countries already? Several European governments have been moved away from some of their defense investment pledges. So I think that really is going to be the, the test over the next couple of years to see if, if that can be maintained. And then the other, uh, other impulse, and we alluded to it earlier, and I, I want to just come back to it briefly, is uh, 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 we just had last week uh, President Schultz, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Chancellor Schultz underscoring again the need to maintain a dialogue with Russia, which I fully uh, understand and I agree with, and I, certainly the United States, the U.S. senior levels of the U.S. administration, both in the political and military channels, have maintained some kind of dialogue, uh, particularly to avoid uh, escalation of the current crisis and inadvertent uh, crises uh, that could be damaging to all of NATO's interests. In, uh, so I, I think that has to be, you know, the near term, there does need to be some kind of high-level crisis management mechanism maintained. But we have to be careful uh, about uh, that leading to, and we'll see, you know, what uh, uh, President Macron and President Biden agreed to last week in terms of how this, uh, uh, once again, another opening that, uh, that Macron seemed to suggest was needed, uh, how that could go forward uh, in the near term with Russia. Uh, but uh, it seems to me it's far, it's really premature to have any kind of negotiations over a final settlement in Ukraine. So thank, thank you for that. Let me just say, <coughs> in closing, the Prague summit, the NATO Prague summit was absolutely historic. Uh, it was an opportunity then, and it really demonstrated how that unity of purpose with a focused mission uh, that had certainly political and military uh, Im and impact was key then, and it's certainly key now, and as underscored and I think proven by the invasion of uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I want to congratulate the sponsors today, and if I may, uh, not only the Czech Embassy and the other sponsors, and of course the Atlantic Council, uh, in this case for hosting right here, but why is it so significant? It's very significant because it's we're right to be looking at what went right, and a lot did <laughs> in this case, and it's instructive for us for going forward. And we were very lucky to have all of you, and especially you, Minister, because you traveled the farthest to come here today. <laughs> so thank you for that and give your view. So please join me in thanking these very distinguished panelists. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon. I'm in Berkeley, California. And believe me, I would, even though I love Berkeley, I wish I could be with you in person, especially when I saw the, the last panel with my old friend Sasha Vondra and my old comrade in arms, Sandy Virschbau. This discussion is timely, not just retrospective. So thanks to the Czech Embassy, to Foreign Minister Lepofsky, to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, to the Agello 2000 Foundation, and of course, to the Atlantic Council in general and the Europe Center in particular. It's good to put this together. I'm gonna to start with the particular and go to the general. I was in Prague 20 years ago for the NATO summit. And I went there with pretty easy in my mind because I thought, you know, NATO enlargement is the big decision this, this NATO summit has to make. But if we don't make it this time, we can make it the next time. It's okay. Well, as it turns out, there was not going to be a next time. There would be no next time. At months after the Prague NATO summit, the US launched the ill-begotten war in Iraq. The West fractured. And by the time we patched ourselves together, Putin was stronger, and more virulently anti-Western. By the time we got around to thinking about enlargement next, it was at the Bucharest 2008 summit. Had we not enlarged NATO then, and in particular, had we not made the decision to bring the Baltic states into NATO, we could never have made it at all. And we would be dealing not with the Russian annexation of purported annexation of four Ukrainian oblasts. We will be dealing with the People's Republic of Narva and probably the Russian annexation of that and other territory in the Baltics. Yeah, that's right. We saved, NATO saved that situation by acting in time. That was President Bush's decision. His administration cut it, could have gone either way. At the time, NATO enlargement to the Baltic states was considered to be a stretch. It was considered some to be by some to be radical, even impossible. But he made that decision. He pushed it forward. He got his administration on board, and it was an example of the freedom agenda's good side. And it worked, which leads to the more general point. What is NATO for? What is its purpose? NATO enlargement probably saved the Baltic states from another Russian invasion. Let it sink in. We think that the mid 20th century World War II style aggression is for the history books. And in the run up to the, the current phase of the Russo Ukrainian War, many could not imagine that Russia would launch a full-scale war of invasion against its European neighbor. All of World War II, yeah. Decades of bad analogies with Adolf Hitler left us allergic to seeing the real danger of a 20th century style tyrant once again in the Kremlin making decisions. NATO is the instrument of European security. Yeah, yeah, as, as the quip went, keep the Russians out, the Germans down and the Americans in. But keeping the Russians out is no joke. That's what NATO did. To abstract a bit from that, we are dealing in the world with two great dictatorial powers, Russia and China. China is the more profound threat, perhaps. Russia is the more virulent one. China may launch a war of aggression against Taiwan, or it may not. Russia has launched several wars of aggression. Georgia in 2008, 
Ukraine in 2014, and again this year. NATO is the instrument by which, through which, Europe was united, achieving the objectives of the Atlantic Charter and overturning Yalta Europe. That deed was done partly through decisions made in Western capitals, but mostly by action taken by the people of Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm thinking of you, Sasha Vondra, and our Polish and Slovak and Baltic and Hungarian friends. NATO's purpose is to achieve was to achieve a Europe whole and free. To maintain that achievement, despite the rise of Vladimir Putin. It was a cliche, especially in Germany, that war doesn't decide anything. Well, Putin thinks wars can decide the fate of nations. And sadly, he may be right. The Ukrainians are fighting a war of national survival. The Russians are fighting a war of aggression. The battlefield hangs in the balance. But as Sally Painter said toward the end of the last panel, let's take a step back and realize what we have achieved. Putin thought the West was as decadent as he hopes it would be. It, it is proven otherwise. The Ukrainians did not collapse. The West did not splinter. The Germans have recognized, albeit in grudging fashion, the colossal error of their energy policy. But before we criticize the Germans, can we just stipulate that most Western powers, including the United States, got Russia wrong and sometimes badly wrong at some point? The Poles and Balts are well in a position to say they told us so, and indeed they did tell us so. But we listened in time. And NATO be an instrument of uniting a better Europe, meaning a Europe with a better Russia in the future? Is Russia doomed to be a hostile, sullen, violent, warmongering power forever? That's its reality now, and there are a great many people who say that is Russia's fate and will be. Maybe, maybe, or maybe not. We shouldn't forget, and Sandy Vershbaum knows this better than I do, how far we had come with Russia before the rise of Vladimir Putin. That Russia is ground down and ground under. It is not gone. The path to a better Russia is lies in Russia's hands. But we can help set better conditions for such a Russia by defending Ukraine now and not rushing to premature negotiations, which start out with grand, uh, grand uh, design and end up forcing Ukraine, would end up forcing Ukraine to give up its territory and its citizens. I think the Biden administration has got it about right. They haven't ruled out negotiations, but they haven't rushed to them. Last week, President Biden said he was willing to have negotiations with Putin. The Russians promptly reiterated their maximum objectives that negotiations start through a recognition of Russia's territorial conquest in Ukraine, conquests they have not consolidated and, may, and are not maintaining. A profoundly unrealistic position. NATO enlargement fulfilled the promise of an undivided Europe as far as the Russian border. NATO remains the indispensable instrument of Western security. NATO may have roles to play in other parts of the world. Prague summit 20 years ago was a high point of foresight. And at the ceremonial dinner, after the decisions had been made to invite seven countries to join the alliance, Václav Havel, then president of the Czech Republic, and Jan Iliescu, 
then president of Romania, reminisced that they had attended the last meeting of the Warsaw Pact. And they both said that they much preferred to be where they were. And the room applauded. It was a good moment. We are in tough times now. But let's steel ourselves for the tasks ahead. Show solidarity with the Ukrainians who are fighting for their freedom and ours. Be realistic, but not sacrificing our principles. Remember what it is that brought us so far. This conference, Central Europe Week, is not simply a retrospective or a celebration of one part of Europe's past achievements. It's a challenge to us to maintain our coherence, our commitment, our principles that have carried us so far and that we need now more than ever. Thanks for the opportunity. It's an honor to be here and hopefully soon in person. Thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, what a dramatic way to kind of kick off this panel. I mean, I, I imagine Dan sitting out there in, in Berkeley and I'm, I have to think a crowd of people uh, gathering around to hear his oration there. And he really made two, uh, several important points, but a couple of them resonated with me. Is one, we often forget how important NATO is as a driver, as an instrument of transatlantic action. And then he really kind of underscored the power and benefits of NATO embracing the transatlantic aspirations of Central Europeans. I think inferring all, almost that, you know, those who had their, their aspirations embraced and got membership haven't been attacked, have been more secure. Uh, and those who haven't, unfortunately, have, 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 have paid a price for that. And here I'm thinking, of course, Ukraine. And then he kind of put out an important point that NATO has to continue the, that, that effort to embrace the transatlantic aspiration of those Central Europeans that still aren't in the alliance so that we can complete the vision of a Europe that's undivided, secure, fr and free. My name is Ian Brzezinski. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council and the Europe Center and the Brent Scowcroft Center. And I'm delighted to uh, serve as the host of, of this panel entitled Grappling the Geopolitical Reality on NATO's Eastern Front. And I'd like to echo uh, Dan's uh, thanks to, to, our, uh, to our partners in, this, in Central Europe Week. That's uh, including the Czech Embassy, the Agello 2000 Association, and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We're delighted to work with these organizations on this interesting series of discussions we're having this week focused on Central Europe. And to you all in our audience, both here physically and uh, virtually, thank you for joining us. Uh, those who are out there virtually, and I guess those on their cell phones, can uh, tune into this conversation and engage us by using the hashtag, hashtag Central Europe Week, to follow along and, and, and tag us on social media. You know, to set the context for our, our discussion, grappling with the geopolitical reality of NATO's Eastern Front, it, it's very clear there is no geopolitical reality more stark and more brutal than Russia's ongoing invasion, unjustified and brutal ongoing inv invasion of Ukraine nearly 10 months of war, you know, probably 100,000 casualties on the Ukrainian side killed in action or wounded, tens of thousands of civilians killed, millions of refugees internally displaced and been forced out of the country. It's a war uh, driven by Putin whose strategy includes a regime of terror that he imposes on occupied territories, the systemic, systematic attack of civilian infrastructure, transport routes, hospitals, schools, energy nodes, and goes on, and of course, nuclear threats. And Central Europe has emerged as the operational hub of the West's response to this, to this brutal invasion, to this atrocity. It's become the West Germany, so to, call, so, so to speak, of, of the Cold War. It's been highlighted by Central Europe's warm generosity, its embrace of the refugees, the millions of refugees that have come into their territories. It's provided levels of assistance, both economically and in terms of security systems that proportionally lead in the alliance. Estonia, I think, has the highest proportional rate of giving weapons uh, to and security assistance to the Ukrainians as a percentage of GDP, to the point of almost irresponsibility uh, when it comes to the Est Estonian arsenal. And it's not surprising to many of us that Central Europe 
has probably been the greatest source of resolve and determination when it comes down to leaning forward in the support of Ukraine and the pushing back of Russia. This war has marked, to use a phrase we love at the Atlantic Council, an inflection point in the NATO alliance. And the role it plays in the defense of transatlantic interests in Central and Eastern Europe and the Eastern frontier, and how it is postured for that role and how it executes that role. And to discuss these issues and how the alliance is grappling with this, the new geopolitical reality of our day, we have a great panel for practitioners, for opinion leaders. Um, let me start with Robin Dunnigan, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. She covers Central and Eastern Europe for the department. She's a career foreign service officer, served as charge in, in DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission, the US Embassy in, Aust in, uh, US Embassy in Austria. Uh, she's not new to being a DAS. She served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Energy uh, in the Obama administration, if I remember correctly. And she served in multiple posts around the world. Jan Havernack, right next to her, is Deputy Chief of Mission here in Washington to the Czech Embassy. He comes from being a Deputy Defense Minister in, 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 in Prague and brings, ex brings extensive NATO experience, having served in the Policy Planning Unit of the Secretary General of NATO and as a Chief uh, Defense Counselor in the Czech Embassy in, at NATO. He also brings an American degree from uh, Tufts <laughs> University. Jim Townsend, who I've worked with and been friends with for, I guess, almost three decades now. We work together in the, in, in, in the Pentagon. He's an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. He's also president of the Atlantic Treaty Association, of which the Atlantic Council is, is a chapter. He served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for NATO and Europe Policy for eight years under the Obama administration. I, I don't think anyone's matched that in the history of DASDs or NATO Europe in the Pentagon. It's not good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> he also served at the U.S. Mission in NATO as a Director for Defense Plans Division. Uh, and there are a few people in Washington who has his understanding of the, the de NATO defense planning system. And he brings two decades of public service in the State Department, uh, Department of Defense, and also some years on Capitol Hill. And Robert Voss, another longtime friend, he's the founder and president of Globsec. Globsec is a Bratislava, a Slovak-based think tank committed to enhancing security, prosperity, and sustainability in Europe and globally. He founded Globsec in 2005, and I've had the privilege of watching him transform a small group of committed, a cabal, small cabal of committed transatlanticists in, in Bratislava into a leading center, a leading European center for research and convening that addresses not just the interests in Central Europe and Europe, but increasingly globally now. It's an organization that has literally lived up to its name, Globsec. And every year, there's the Globsec Forum in Bratislava, which is Central Europe's most important convening annually, and arguably becoming one of the most important European security events uh, annu annually. So thank you for joining uh, this conversation. And I want to start with Robin, with kind of a broad question. The, the invasion of Ukraine, its brutality, its impact, um, its stress on defense resources, its stresses on alliance unity, you know, has, has been a challenge for, for the alliance. And the alliance has done some great things in response. Uh, it's done a lot to reinforce its frontiers. It's had its own internal debates. When you look back over these 10 months, what has Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine revealed about the strengths of the alliance and where the alliance has areas to work on? Uh, thank you, Ian, and thanks for having us. And I have to say to Dan out there, as a Cal grad, I love to see him speaking to us from the streets ah. of Berkeley. It's fun. Um, so I, I would take... I think issue with one of the assumptions in your question is that alliance unity has been under stress because, in fact, I think what the last 10 months have shown us is just how incredibly unified our alliance is. And I think it's also shown us that NATO as an alliance is really a living, evolving alliance that can not only deal with emerging crises but can use those crises to emerge sort of stronger and better prepared. So not only have we seen this incredible unity, we saw um, allies go to the Madrid summit really ready to look at our defense posture in Europe, NATO's defense posture in Europe, and our deterrence in Europe with the Russia's, with Russia's war in Ukraine kind of at the center of our thinking about it. And I think, I personally think that the Madrid summit was incredibly successful in having us 
kind of take that 360 degree look at force posture, uh, you know, across land, air, sea, cyber, space, and how we react. And so just very quickly, you know, we used to have four battle groups on the eastern flank. Now we have eight. The United States has increased its members um, in Europe by 20,000. So now we're at 100,000 troops that are revolving um, within Europe, many of those on the eastern flank. We've forward stationed permanent forces headquarters um, of the U.S. Army Fifth Corps in Poland. And I think every NATO member has taken steps along these lines to really look at our posture on the eastern flank. So I, I think the biggest lesson uh, of the last 10 months is that we are unified, our, our alliance is strong, and it's adaptable and meets crises, um, comes out of crises stronger. Let me just push a little bit, I mean, in terms of lessons learned. Could NATO have done anything in the spring of 2021 when Russia was building up its forces to maybe pr present a deterrent posture that might have caused Putin to think otherwise? You know, I mean, first of all, I would say that deterrence has worked in for NATO. Yeah, you, Russia has not invaded in a NATO country in Europe. Um, but I was part of the team that worked very hard in the run-up as we saw, the, as our intelligence showed, that forces were accumulating on the border from the spring all the way up to October, November, December. You know, we worked very, very hard to have a real conversation with the Russians about their security concerns. And that was not a successful um, endeavor. I, I believe that, just as Dan said in his opening remarks, that President Putin intended to do this, and there was really nothing we could do to mm -hmm. stop it, um, his, his intent to invade Ukraine, further invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Jan, you know, you're a defense planner. Uh, you've been watching, you, you've been shaping your own country's investments uh, for, for defense. And one thing that's, that's notable about the, uh, the war o over Ukraine is the application of new technologies drones, the decisive role information plays, not just in terms of public awareness, but the you know, ability to transmit information about where troops and tanks are and effectuating attacks on, 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 on those targets. Uh, how, how, what, it, what has struck you about this war in terms of the technology that has been demonstrated in the battlefield, how the battlefield is evolving, and what does it mean for NATO's force posture as it reinforces its defense of its eastern frontier? Thanks, Ian, and thank you also to the Atlantic Council for uh, giving us the opportunity to have that uh, conversation, not only about the past, but also about uh, the current situation and the future. We're very grateful for the transatlantic partnership and, and the friendship. To your question, mm -hmm. well, for many years we've been having these discussions, whether it's the hardware versus technology, and what the war in Ukraine has really shown, uh, this is the multi-domain uh, operation. Um, and this is the multi-domain warfare, and we're seeing integration of bits and pieces of all the previous conflicts over the past 20 uh, to 30 years. Um, you've mentioned information warfare, nuclear cyber rattling, but also the war amongst the people that General Rupert Smith would, uh, would call it, uh, uh, and of course uh, bits of uh, cyber, uh, a lot of technology, and everything is being integrated into uh, this, this tragic, uh, tragic war. And uh, it really shows us that uh, we no longer can choose uh, whether we want to go one or either way. And I think NATO has been on the right path uh, for the few couple of years. I would have wished to say, you know, we started this uh, much earlier, but I think the latest decisions in Madrid actually put us on the right way. The lessons learned are that we certainly have to invest in those new capabilities. We have to do more on interoperability. Uh, remember 12 years ago, there was the smart defense era when we thought we could have done more with, uh, with less resources. But of course, uh, the, we're now redefining, uh, redefining smart defense actually with technology being uh, being in the prime. And it also shows us that we really have to take the relationship with private sector seriously. Uh, in fact, I would argue we're experiencing a new revolution in military affairs, the role that private sector has played. And imagine uh, what would have the situation looked like had these tycoons been uh, not on our sides, uh, on, on, uh, on Ukraine's sides, but on Russia's sides. I mean, it uh, really is uh, important that we keep engaging with the private sector and the defense industry, but on all, not only in the defense industry. And then um, maybe final point uh, to your initial question, uh, for NATO, it really also shows that we need to work on 
the way not only we gather intelligence through all these data points, but how we improve our joint threat assessment and how we sort of feed in into the decision making uh, um, decision making cycle. But I'm optimistic. Um, I think the decisions at Madrid uh, that I hope Jim is going to talk about as well um, are putting us on the right path, but it's going to be costly. It's going to require a lot of intergovernmental cooperation, a lot of solidarity, and a lot of uh, public-private interaction. Is 2% enough in terms of national defense spending, commitment to national defense to meet the requirements that we're beginning to recognize in, in light of the Rus Russia's invasion of Ukraine? It's the minimum. It's the minimum. There is already talk uh, by some allies at NATO that uh, we should be uh, going beyond the 2%, and some indeed are spending more than 2%. Uh, but we also have to be smart. It's not about throwing money at the problem. It's really, uh, really uh, where you invest, what kind of capabilities you get, how you integrate that, how you channel that through your common and control system. Mm -hmm. Jim, Robin mentioned you know, the, the force buildup, moving from battalion to brigade level deployments as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence, the extension of that enhanced forward presence to Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Romania. And we're already seeing exercises of the US-led uh, enhanced forward presence brigade in, in, in Romania. There's, of course, the changes that uh, NATO is making to, to its strategy, the new defense and deterrence uh, 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 approach. Is this enough? Is this enough to really ensure that we have a credible defense uh, for NATO's eastern frontier? Well, it's never enough, and that's the easy answer. And so it's, it's so what do you do now is what we have to focus on. But if I could start first by uh, going back to what Dan was saying about the, the Prague summit. So I was at the Prague summit as well. Uh, and, uh, and I thought I would just pass on that uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, of course, was at the table uh, during a lot of the discussions of, of the enlargement, of inviting uh, the, the members of the Big Bang, as they said. And what was interesting is after he was finished with his particular meeting, he came back and saw us. And he said, you know, uh, I heard what the Baltic representatives had to say. And he said, I really appreciate now enlargement and what, the, what it means for the nations, particularly the, the Balts and the others. And he, he came away with this feeling of wanting to really make this work. Uh, and if you know Don Rumsfeld, the late Don Rumsfeld, you know bringing him along on anything that he didn't come up with himself uh, was difficult. And I was, I was the, the first time I saw him kind of introspective about that. And I don't know if you were there, Ian, but it was, was there. Yep. It was very interesting to hear him uh, all of a sudden get it when it came to what enlargement was all about. But on Madrid uh, and uh, on Is It Enough, um, well, it's, it's not, and I, and, I, and I think that that's not a slam against Madrid or against the administration or against uh, Stoltenberg or anything. I think, I, I think what Ukraine has shown us is the problems that at NATO we need to really begin to, to really focus and do something about, and Jan had mentioned some of these. But I, I feel you've got to look at Madrid in the context of the uh, summits that came before. I think the, the summit that we had in Wales was quite historic. Uh, that was a wartime summit. That was after the invasion, and that was when we began to set uh, goals and set our sights on trying to rebuild U.S. force posture in Europe, NATO deterrence, the 2% goal. Was, there were a lot of things that happened in Wales that we then built on when it came to Warsaw a few years later, the Warsaw summit. Uh, we added to that in terms of readiness, in terms of force posture, uh, NATO force posture. And then with Madrid, it, we again added on to that base that was built by the other uh, two summits that came before. There were historic aspects of, for Madrid. I mean, you had China mentioned in the, in the various communiques and the, and the new strategic concept. Finally, we had Russia put in the proper box. Uh, they were no longer seen as a cooperative uh, nation with NATO. They were seen as the threat that they are. So that was in there as well. Uh, you had Sweden and Finland, of course, uh, coming in, and, and as well as the 360 uh, and the NATO 2030 aspects of climate and this type of thing. So those were in there too. And those would have been the headlines, frankly, had that not been uh, for uh, Ukraine and this be being another wartime summit. Uh, and so there were some important and some historic things in there. But I think what happens now is taking a lot of the military aspects of the Madrid summit that were agreed, a lot of the things that the military authorities were putting together in terms of doctrine, in terms of what they were going to do uh, in terms of regional planning, uh, of taking that that was agreed at Madrid and then beginning to implement that. That's happening now. They're beginning to put uh, some of the structure together in terms of 
what my, what my, uh, my colleagues from the State Department said in terms of that, those forces being put out there on the front lines, the increase in numbers. So what we need to be looking for now is how do we get also to the, some of the basic problems that have not been fixed by Madrid or anything else, and that is the basics in terms of ammunition, uh, in terms of, of uh, stocks of uh, a lot of the basic warfighting equipment that are now gone because they've been given to Ukraine. I'm not talking about the U.S. here as much as a lot of the allies. Um, we're finding ourselves as the months go on with a lot of the ability of the alliance uh, to, actually, to actually fight. The ammunition stocks is just one example that is, I think is readily apparent to everyone. So Madrid was very important in that lineup of those three summits. Uh, Madrid was important. It laid the foundation for a lot of important uh, work that's leading to uh, more NATO forces along the frontier. But Ukraine is showing us how much more work remains to be done by the allies and by NATO as an institution in terms of defense planning and where NATO needs to help get the allies to in the years to come to replenish our stocks uh, and to replenish uh, not just forces, but the readiness of them as well. So there's a lot of work ahead. Looking forward to the next summit. <laughs> so what about, I mean, everyone's focused very much on the depletion of stocks. What does this mean in terms of NATO's posture? And is, should that be more prepositioned stocks in Central and Eastern Europe? Should, you know, the United States has recently made a decision to have a permanent presence in, in Poland. Right. Small headquarters and supply unit. Right. Should that be larger? Should we be expecting our Western Europeans to be deploying on a permanent basis in the Baltics and Romania, in addition to what the United States is doing? And Poland? I think the answer to all that is yes. And I think we have to get there. It's going to be work to get there because we really do have to refine. So what do you mean by prepositioning stocks? Where would they go? go? Who would host them? Is this like prepo for the Brits? Is this prepo for Canadians? Uh, so they don't have to, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, thought that needs to, and quick thoughts that need to go into prepositioning and in terms of permanent deployments as well. Rotations are fine, and we can talk about U.S. rotations forever on this, but I think there's got to be more um, allied forces on the line that aren't necessarily rotational. And I am, frankly, concerned about uh, NATO fatigue in terms of keeping forces on the on the front line along the border. I mean, you know, the the, the forces in the Balts are great, and in Romania, Bulgaria, th there's a lot of important force posture changes that have been made since the last couple of summits. But will they be there a year from now or two years from now? Because we've got to think long term. This isn't going to be over anytime soon. So will we have nations coming back to NATO and saying, look, we can't afford to have our forces in Bulgaria anymore? We're going to have to pull them out. We're going to have to do a rotational scheme that's every other year. I mean, I'm worried about that fatigue element. So in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what allies might need to do, there's not just buying uh, ammunition and buying things that they're going to need for the war fight, but how are they going to keep those forces forward deployed? Because it's expensive to do that, and that means more defense spending. And so there is there's some concern there that I have in terms of, of being able to make sure nations are, are going to be there for the long haul. So here, Robert, we're talking a lot about how to re reinforce NATO's eastern frontier and talking about what the West Europeans and the U.S. should do. What do the Central Europeans need to do? And, uh, you know, in addition to what do they need to do to help be part and a constructive contributor to, to that effort, not just a beneficiary to, uh, to it, how confident are they in the assertion, the, the Madrid assertion of not one inch of our territory will ever be given up. So first of all, I want to say that this is the moment for Central Europe to lead. We've been talking about the Russian threat for decades, but now it's there. So we have to turn this into the leadership and shaping the response of the alliance and uh, of Europe. And uh, it has worked. Look at the first visit uh, of Prime Minister Janez Jansha, Fiala and, uh, and Morawiecki in Ukraine. That showed the way that Eastern Europe mm -hmm. stands behind Ukraine and we are going to give all uh, of our equipment that we can to Ukraine because they are defending not only themselves, but also uh, Europe and our own territory. And it's not a cliche. It might sound to many uh, people in the Western Europe as a cliche, but I think that, uh, and I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the future of the West is now being decided in Eastern Europe and how we perform in this conflict will define the credibility of our institutions for decades to come. Because what Russia did uh, to Ukraine, it's not only uh, an aggression towards a sovereign country, it's a frontal attack on the very basic principles of international law, 
and of the very basic principles of international order that we have created together after the Second World War. And if we compromise an inch in these principles, the credibility uh, of our institutions who are, who are, um, who are uh, supporting uh, these principles will, will, will just decrease. So I think uh, we have to have a clear Central European leadership, and we've done, the, we've done a lot already, uh, hosting refugees, sending weapons. Uh, Slovakia sent the S-300s really at the early stages. We are sending almost everything we have. We don't have more, but we can still do a lot how, how we can move some of the production lines in Eastern Europe so, so we, can, um, we can still continue in supporting uh, Ukraine uh, in, in long term. But basically, I think that this war is more complex and is, has more front lines than the physical one in Ukraine. That's one front line. And Ukrainians are paying by blood for what we have taken for granted. But there is a second front line of the same war, which is going on inside of, inside of our societies, which is in information space. That's the same, uh, that's another front line of the same war with the goal to decrease uh, our political ability to react and to defend ourselves. And the first, third and fourth front line of the same war uh, is going on in economic and energy uh, domains. So I think Putin has really launched a frontal attack against the West. In order to win this war and to help Ukraine, we need to win the, uh, the, the other three front lines as well at home. If we lose there, we will see fatigue next year. We will see decrease of political willingness to help Ukraine. And I think that the role of Central Europeans is just to wave the flag as much as possible, not to allow the fatigue to come uh, to the Western European uh, uh, countries, not to allow a dirty deal which would be unsustainable. We need to make sure that we don't make mistakes from the past, uh, thinking that making a dirty deal will be sustainable. And we've seen it, Czechoslovakia has seen it in the past yeah. on the mm -hmm. Munich, uh, when we all thought, they all thought that uh, they can prevent the war by, by uh, doing the, the, the in the 38th, uh, the, the Munich agreement. But it just took uh, one year and um, uh, Germany got stronger. I think that's the same case. Russia is losing militarily. I'm sure it lost politically already, because I cannot imagine a world where Russia will come back uh, as a full member of, uh, and trusted member of international, uh, international uh, architecture uh, soon. Uh, they lost their credibility as a stable supplier of energy, and they will have difficulties to get it back in the next decades. So they lost politically, they isolated themselves. They are losing militarily. It doesn't mean that the war will stop. It will only stop if we will be weak at home and we will think in a way that we don't want to provoke Russians. And I want to say that enlargement of NATO was never a provocation because Vladimir Putin has been very consistent in why he, he attacked uh, Ukraine. Because he, he thought Ukraine has no right to exist. He was, he, he was repeating that Ukraine is not a nation. And that the biggest geopolitical uh, mistake of the 20th century was dissolution of USSR. So that's the, real, that's the real cause, not the enlargement of NATO. Enlargement of NATO, as uh, Dan Fried has very clearly said, prevented Russians to go even further. So we have not to be weak. We, we, the deterrence works, and we can extend that deterrence. You know, the, the accident that uh, a rocket uh, fell in, into, into, in, into Ukraine, I think we should go further, and we, we should say that it is in our um, uh, interests as NATO and national interest to extend the, the air defense on the eastern uh, territory of Ukraine to prevent these kind of accidents. And if we will go uh, uh, this way, I think Russia will just accept it. If we will be weak, they will define the, the red line. So it's us mm -hmm. who needs to define the red lines. Let me follow up on that question. I'm sure my colleagues here will have uh, insights on too. In some ways, you know, this tragedy we saw in Poland in which a, um, it, it appears that a Ukrainian air defense system that was launched in response to, among a response to some 70 to 100 Russian missiles attacking Ukraine that, that day, one of their air defense systems misfired or, or ricocheted and landed in Poland, killing two Polish, two innocent Polish farmers. So this was a direct contradiction, a violation of the, the NATO pledge, the American pledge to NATO, not one inch of NATO territory will be affected. 
granted that there was, this crisis demonstrated NATO's consultative processes worked quite effectively, which I think was a reflection of real planning mm -hmm. and scenario um, um, exercises by Poland, by the United States, by NATO headquarters and, and others, and kudos to that. Are you satisfied with the alliance's response to, to, that, to that tragedy? Or are you inferring that maybe we, there should be something punitive that should have been exercised uh, to demonstrate to Russia that we will not tolerate such um, violations of alliance territory and, and attacks on al you know, allied citizens? I think that the management of all the accident was, was very good, very excellent, not to choose to escalate this on the territory of NATO. So I think it was a very wise a very, uh, very good management of all this accident because it could have gone either way. But I think we can go a few steps further and making sure that in order to prevent these kind of, uh, of um, uh, accidents, we can extend a little bit our uh, air defense beyond the territory of NATO. I think uh, Russia would just, will have no choice just to accept it because we are sometimes afraid. Also, when you look, um, uh, there are many voices, Crimea is just uh, too far and too much. Mm -hmm. But look what happened when Ukrainians uh, attacked Crimea. Russians retreated, they pulled off mm -hmm. uh, uh, th their ships. I think uh, what they understand is power. Uh, also another point I, I, I want to mention, that when Russians started to hit um, uh, the infrastructure of Ukraine, we as the West, did not do much. We did not impose new wave of sanctions. I think we should do it. We should do it very quickly that, um, to, to make them understand that it has costs for them. We've been a little bit uh, uh, silent there. Now, Rob, let me turn to you because I, while I'm impressed by the Alliance's response, I kind, of, I, I kind of fall, I think, in the camp of, of Robert in that, well, we don't want to overreact to that tragedy in Poland. Not reacting at all, I think, sends probably a, a, the wrong signal. Because I'm wondering what Putin's learning and concluding from, from the alliance not taking any action, be it economics, further economic sanctions or the extension of an air defense zone, which, by the way, could just extend to western Ukraine, would involve any deployments that could be, quote, unquote, threatening to the Russians. Uh, it would just shoot down incoming warheads and provide a humanitarian zone for, for, for the Ukrainians. But not responding, instead of just saying how great we were in self-restraint, I'm wondering if that emboldens Putin. Um, can I first, there are a couple of other things said, and I do want to answer that, but I do want to take as a, long as you a answer couple that of question. minutes. I'm going to. <laughs> One is on Central European leadership, because I should have mentioned it in, in response to the first question, because I think if you look at the way the Czech government kept um, EU united during your presidency, the way Poland has performed as chair and office of the OSCE, Slovakia when you donated the S-300 so early, so early before others were giving those kinds of systems. And I could go through... Um, almost every Central European country and give an example of where the leadership has been incredible and I think really important. Um, the other is your comment about that the Ukrainians are fighting for all of our freedom. That is absolutely true and we cannot let our publics forget it and it's incumbent upon all of us who work in this to, to, to ensure that Russia does not win the disinformation war because even though we're all giving a lot to support Ukraine, we're all going to have to give more. Um, the other is whether or not Putin is winning, which he's not, he's losing, and I think he's losing on the whole front that you outlined. Um, but it brings us to this, uh, I think they will probably at some point try to be, have the moral high ground that they're trying to negotiate a peace. And uh, Dan said in the beginning, and I want to reiterate it, it is not the U.S. government's position to tell Ukraine when it needs to negotiate. And it certainly doesn't appear to us that this is the moment as Russia bombards civilian energy infrastructure, um, annexes four territories, calls it it, uh, its own. And really what Putin has done since October 10th, these waves, I think today was our sixth, seventh wave mm -hmm. of you know hundreds of missiles down on energy infrastructure. The, it's, it's we're on the brink of a real humanitarian catastrophe that um, I think does need a, a response. Anyway, um, back to your question. Look, President Biden has been extremely clear that we will defend every single inch of NATO territory, but we also do not want this war to be between the United States and Russia or between NATO and Russia. Like bringing NATO into this war is not something President Biden takes lightly. And so 
I think the response thus far by the Polish government has been, and by NATO, has been spot on. The Polish government is still undergoing its investigation. When it's done, we will comment on the results of the investigation. We have no reason to believe that the initial indications uh, that, it, that it was likely a, a Ukrainian missile, or remnants of Ukrainian missile, or, or we have no indications that that's not accurate. But the bottom line is it wouldn't have happened if Russia wasn't invade, had, hadn't invaded Ukraine and wasn't sending missiles at Ukraine and Ukraine wasn't defending itself. So, um, but, but you know, pre like I said, President Biden has been clear on where his principles are. Jim, let me turn to you on, on, on nuclear deterrence because one of the reasons why President Biden and the alliance has said the alliance is not going to get involved in, in, in this invasion of Ukraine directly because we don't want World War III. Are we at risk of, uh, is the alliance at risk of setting some dangerous precedents when it comes down to the management of nuclear coercion? I mean, think about it. I mean, a key element of Russian strategy, Putin's strategy, has been to use nuclear weapons, to use nuclear coercion to keep the West out. And in some ways, in some ways, he's been very successful in that regard. And I wonder if that just keeps him, that further emboldens him, sustains his confidence that he can prevail in achieving his objectives. Are there lessons that are perhaps not the lessons we want learned outside of, of, of this theater, particularly Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. or, for that matter, in the Middle East? Well, I mean, that's a great question, and, and this is something that uh, has been theoretical for years, uh, this idea of how the nuclear card is played by an adversary. Uh, we've had all kinds of exercises and uh, theology written about this. So we've had the Cuban Missile Crisis as kind of the, the test of a lot of theories. But now we've actually got a situation where that nuclear card has been played in terms of a adversary saying, We're gonna, I'm going to have this as an option here. Uh, to, if you all uh, cross a certain line or if I feel threatened by you or whatever, uh, that card is now on the table face up and everyone sees it. And so that has had a deterrent effect. Um, and it's something that we now have to try to figure out. So that how do you deal with that kind of deterrent threat uh, using a nuclear card? What's the, re what's the proper response? What do you do? Uh, how do you not embolden uh, the use of that card uh, by others? Uh, or incentivize others to, to develop nuclear weapons so that they can be able to deter uh, you know, someone else? And that's, and that's something that we now have to really think about, and NATO really has to think about it too. Uh, and I, uh, you know, NATO, uh, you know, says we're going to be a nuclear alliance as long as there's nuclear weapons or words to that effect, uh, which is fine. Got that. Uh, but, but what does NATO do? What, what kind of NATO role is there in this? Uh, we know that the NATO uh, depends on the United States and to also UK and France in, in their own ways in terms of that nuclear capability. But, uh, but NATO's got to think this through as well. And so, you know, the early stages of um, this crisis, the United States came out uh, very firmly and said they're not going to be U.S. boots on the ground. Uh, and uh, a lot of what we said came from an older playbook in terms of how you deal with um, an adversary with nuclear weapons. You want to be transparent. You want to be predictable. You want to make sure they know what we're not going to do as well as what we will do. There was a lot of that um, that was done early on. And there has been some, some uh, criticism of that, saying by, do, by going about it that way, you're taking things off the table that maybe should have been ambiguous. Would we maybe you know, have a card or two to play, uh, and we're going to be ambiguous about it to make you think that we might step up escalation here? I mean, there's some hardball that could have been played earlier on, according to a lot of, 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 of folks watching from the outside. I know on the inside, having worked there for a long time, that these things were discussed. And the decision was made to go in the, in the, in the, in the way in which the Biden administration went. But I think that's fine. But I think we have got to really think through um, whether all of that was correct. Uh, and what do we do for future situations like this? Because this Pandora's box has been opened by Putin doing that. He's going to, he or his uh, successors are going to be playing that card because they saw that it had uh, fenced off some things that the U.S. Uh, or NATO uh, wasn't going to do in terms of boots on the ground and World War III and that kind of thing. And just the final point is there is a blurring here uh, in terms of conventional uh, weapons and a conventional response to a nuclear card being played mm -hmm. uh, and the role of tactical uh, nuclear weapons that are low yield. Uh, that's, we're not talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki here. And the final point is this. 
whatever the future holds, we have to not be uh, afraid of that nuclear saber being rattled. Uh, he, uh, Putin has rattled that nuclear saber to try to split off European or U.S. publics uh, because they're too afraid of what might happen. Uh, and so there is, it is incumbent upon us and on this administration and on NATO to make sure the publics understand that this is now a feature of warfare. And you cannot be afraid of that nuclear saber being rattled. As hard as it is not to be afraid, it's being used to intimidate. And we have to make sure alliance publics know that they have nothing to be afraid of there, that we have this, this under control. And that's going to be difficult to do. I want to bring a European perspective in this looking at you, Jan. I mean, you know, Jim has made a good point that this, is, this genie is out of the bottle. We have to assume this is going to be exercised in the future. Uh, is this time for NATO to take a real serious look before, for example, the Vilnius summit in 2023 uh, at, its nuclear at its nuclear doctrine and perhaps even its nuclear posture? NATO is doing that. And in fact, we've been doing that for many years uh, in terms of exercising and uh, uh, getting our messaging aligned. But uh, it's, as Jim said, it has, uh, it's the really first time in, in many years uh, that this has been tested live. And the reality is that we're also learning. Uh, many of our NATO allies are learning how to navigate you know, through, through the, uh, the time uh, when everything is being blurred. I mean, uh, there's very little I can add because you know Jim has been a great inspiration, and uh, we're coming f from the same th uh, school of thought on, on NATO affairs. But uh, definitely, uh, some European allies are not comfortable with the situation, and uh, but others are more ready to address that. And I'll leave it at that. Let me talk a little bit about Ukraine, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn to Robert here. Y Ukraine made a plea. Zelensky made a very dramatic plea for a rapid accession process for, for Ukraine a couple weeks ago. And he, he was met with deafening silence. Does, does Ukraine merit NATO membership? I think, first of all, if, if we would uh, uh, grant uh, the NATO membership to Ukraine, we would prevent the war. It's difficult. It's very difficult. But uh, it was the same discussion in the past, uh, how far we go, whether this would provoke too much uh, 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 Russians. Uh, and as you said before, um, and Dan Fried said it, uh, probably enlargement of NATO to uh, the Baltic countries prevented Russians uh, uh, to go there. So, but I think first of all, now we have to focus on, on um, making sure that Ukraine prevails, that Ukraine wins the war. Uh, we need to help it uh, as much as we can, and then we can open every other issues. Because I think, first of all, that, that's the most important thing that we need to uh, support Ukraine in the upcoming months. Mm -hmm. Robin, you know, the, the alliance came out in, in, in Bucharest and kind of reiterated its commitment to eventually bringing Ukraine in as a repeat of the Bucharest uh, mm -hmm. pledge back in, in, in 2008. But it struck me as kind of ringing a little bit hollow. It's kind of a reiteration of old language. Wouldn't it be useful as part of the strategy to support Ukraine now for the alliance to actually take some tangible steps uh, perhaps if we can't get to membership tomorrow, at least kick off something akin to the membership action plan. To me, th 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 this is something that would one, something that one, the, the Ukrainians deserve just some pure moral reasons. They're dying in, in support of alliance interests and values and security uh, to today. Uh, it's putting into process a, 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 the accession of a country that would bring Europe's most battle-hardened an experienced force, it would strengthen NATO, NATO clearly. And there might even be a geopolitical rationale because Putin has been keeping NATO out of the game, so to speak. And wouldn't this small, still symbolic, but maybe somewhat institutionalized step help demonstrate to Putin that you can't push NATO out of any conflict? Well, I, we've reiterated, we did in that statement, but we've reiterated, reiterated many times since that we're still committed to the open door policy, and that includes for Ukraine. And I think that will have to be an important part of the conversation running up to and at Vilnius is the, the, the relationship between Ukraine and NATO going forward. I would say that over the course of the last 10 months, in fact, there is a lot happening that is strengthening uh, Ukraine's ability to be interoperable with NATO. I mean, the, the equipment that they're receiving, the training that they, they're receiving, the, the systems that they're operating, I think you're right. A uh, Ukrainian once said to me, and I, and I think about it a lot, he said, at the end of this war when we win, is Ukraine going to need NATO or is NATO going to need Ukraine? Mm. And I think it's, it's, a, worthwhile, mm -hmm. it's a worthwhile perspective. 
Who's young? We need to have that conversation at NATO. Uh, I mean, for many years we've been living off that Bucharest legacy and being sitting in the comfort, you know, of uh, of that uh, sentence. So. Uh, the discussions have started, uh, but uh, they need to be much more serious because Vilnius is almost around the corner uh, and we're not there yet. And uh, uh, by the way, we are focusing so much on the military aspects of, uh, of uh, potential NATO membership or uh, Ukraine's strength, but we also need to be much more serious about the reconstruction of Ukraine, how we want to assist them further in uh, making sure that this is a sustainable democratic, prospering, uh, prospering country. Uh, and uh, I think we're lagging a little bit behind uh, um, in terms of uh, the timing of that discussion. But of course, this is we have to do that while at the same time sustaining the support that we all have been providing and we've been talking about so far. You know, before I just make sure if there's any questions out in the audience, please, please kick them in. The, uh, if there are, are there any? Because I haven't seen any show up on the, on the screen here. Yeah. But let me just build on this a, a little bit. When you look at post-war, the, the, whatever peace and stability we have a, a, after this war, can you imagine a, a, a security assurance to Ukraine, a security guarantee to Ukraine that doesn't involve some sort of NATO allied presence on Ukrainian territory? You know, I'm saying this, I think on the 28th anniversary of the signing of the um, Budapest Memorandum, in which the UK and Russia and the United States, um, UK, R Russia, and the United States gave commitments to or assurances to, to Ukraine that would take care of their, of their security and stability for giving up nuclear <laughs> weapons. So it's an anniversary date to bring this up. But if you're going to have, if that's good, is that a requirement for a security arrangement that ensures stability and peace after this war? And if so, why not just give Ukraine NATO membership? Jim? Well, I, it's, it's a great question, and I would address it two ways. One is that um, I think the future will, will uh, until Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, we're going to have to give it security guarantees, whether it's some kind of hybrid NATO kind of thing or whether it's uh, the nations themselves are doing it. We're, security guarantees will be number one in terms of, of, uh, of Ukraine, and we'll have to make sure we have the forces and the prepositioned equipment in Ukraine to back that up. You know, I, I agree with the hollow language. I used to just, uh, golly, we'd go through communique after communique after communique, ministerial summits, echoing the agreed language from Bucharest to the point you wanted to scream that became so hollow. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, we've got to do something different at, at, uh, at the next summit. Uh, and I and Ian, I do agree that we've got to have a presence there of some type, uh, military presence of some type, to back that up with something more than just hollow words. I think uh, your point, though, why not just give them, um, why not just give them membership? I w yeah, something we're going to have to talk about. But what I'm really afraid of with that issue is I don't want to divert our attention right now on winning the war in Ukraine. I don't want to split NATO up into camps. I'm not sure we get consensus. I think Steve said that at the last, uh, at the last panel. Um, and I don't want to take us into that kind of debate around NATO, which can be, that, that can weaken us, and that's just what Putin wants to see. But security guarantees, yes. NATO membership, yes. Uh, the sequencing, though, probably is going to be security guarantees and then NATO membership at the, at the appropriate time. But right now, let's focus on the task at hand, and that's beating the Russians helping Ukraine to beat the Russians. Let me <laughs> go ahead, Robert. And Robert, before you go, let me, I'll throw out a question here from, from, from the audience, because it kind of followed on a little bit of point you made. I think you almost kind of answered it. It says, Mr. Voss, was 2008 summit in Bucharest a lost opportunity to deter Putin by admitting Ukraine and Georgia? Do you see any other opportunities that we might have missed uh, leading to and after 2014? That's what I basically said. But, yeah. but uh, first of all, I, I want to say, if, if you are talking about security guarantees, any kind of you know, guarantees of uh, Budapest type of memorandum where we sign that we guarantee some kind of security and is not credible. And the only credible security guarantee is if we will be there physically. Right. If we won't be there physically in the future after the war, uh, any kind of security guarantee will not be credible. So right. I think uh, that if, if, if uh, Ukrainians will win, uh, and I'm sure they will with our support, we'll have to be there afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and that will strengthen the alliance because they, they will be the best uh, trained army uh, in Europe and we will learn from them <laughs> how to fight the future war. And we are seeing also now on the battleground 
how we need to equip uh, our armies in the eastern flank. That is going us a huge lesson. So actually, you know, everybody thought, and, and, and even, even Putin, um, uh, Europe, and NATO, uh, transit, uh, the West is in decline. Um, but actually, Ukrainians are showing us we are not in decline. And we are winning this. We should not be afraid, and we should not lose, uh, lose the next year by losing the political willingness to right. continue. We have to do it next year. Next year will be decisive, because this winter will be tough. But the next winter will be even more. So, so, so I think the clear US center European leadership here will be absolutely crucial uh, in, in, in the upcoming years. Let me throw another can I, oh, can ahead, I just add in real quick? Uh, I agree with what has been said. I would just add, you know, you certainly don't start this discussion by saying that uh, you're going to give security guarantees to a third party that started a genocidal war. I think that's the wrong approach. Uh, uh, <coughs> so I just wanted to make sure that uh, this is also part of the debate. Really, I mean, um, yeah, we also need to look uh, back at what happened in Bucharest in 2008. Uh, why that hollow sentence? It was because uh, the membership action plan was not. Uh, possible. It was uh, an option for many of the NATO uh, NATO allies who are more on the appeasing side towards Russia. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the miscalculation of Putin, why he, he decided to go to Ukraine and why he thought we are weak, because we, we've been showing weakness. 2008, uh, 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 Georgia, what did we do? Not much. A uh, little bit of sanctions. We continued to deal with Russians. We continued the business as usual. 2014, uh, he went with the little green man. We discussed half a year. Was it a little green man? Was it Russian? Was it not? Was it a, was it a, 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 a soldier on vacation? You know, insane. And, and he thought, OK, this is cheap. Uh, I mean, it costs me nothing. So he really thought that we are not ready to unite uh, 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 behind, uh, behind Ukraine. And uh, he miscalculated it tremendously. First of all, he miscalculated. Uh, the reaction of, of the, the, the bravery of Ukrainian people, tremendous bravery, that they stay there, they fight, and they want to win this war, which we thought in the first three days will be lost for them and lost for Europe. But they showed us, no, if you support us, we can win this. You can win this with us together. So this is a tremendous bravery, and we should not back down. We don't have the, you know, we have to morally, politically, and militarily continue until Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians win this war. You know, remember the debate here in Washington about lethal versus non-lethal assistance. Mm -hmm. What a mistake that was in terms of showing weakness. Uh, and uh, that was the debate with the Democrats and then with the Republicans, there was a little bit of lethal, but we lost a lot of time giving Ukraine what they needed. Uh, and uh, that, of course, emboldened uh, uh, Putin as well. So uh, I think you're right. We've had a, it's, we've had a legacy here certainly beginning in 2008, if not a little bit earlier, of showing yeah. that we weren't, uh, you know, we didn't back up our, our threats with real capability. But, but look at under this, this, this war, how Europe is transforming. You know, the German positions now and before are completely somewhere else. So we are seeing a huge rebirth. We are not talking about 2% anymore. Uh, I think, I think that also the German shift in the positions is due to the shouting of Central and Eastern European countries and the leadership we have shown in the face of the war. So I think we need to continue in that. And uh, we might be small countries, but we have a huge political influence over our Western European allies. Quite I was in Chateau Bella at the, at the conference that uh, Robert hosts, and I thought one of the more interesting discussions, who will lead in Europe? And uh, I left convinced that Germany is going to play in a role, whether it likes it or not. But a really interesting leadership coalition could be Germany and the Central Europeans. Yeah. If the Central Europeans play their cards right. And if Germany sticks well, to it and doesn't well, we're walk ready. back. It needs, we're ready. To be, needs to be encouraged. Yeah. Let me throw a question out from Deborah Kagan. It says, Ukraine has become, I'm looking at Jan here, because I think you might be the person to tag <laughs> on this. Ukraine has become a de facto innovation hub for modern warfare. There are lessons learned daily. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't one of these lessons for NATO be with, with the accidental fallout on the Polish territory with the drone that crashed? And the, and the drone that crashed in Croatia. Does NATO's early warning and air defense s systems have room for growth? Are they found wanting? Well, as I said early on in my initial intervention, we got to look at our C2 and Intel assessment uh, for sure. And uh, uh, we have a room to grow. Oh, yeah. And supposedly NATO said a couple months ago, uh, I think it was after defense ministerial, they're going to launch this big air defense 
uh, push uh, with allies signing up to it and everything. And I've, I haven't heard anything since. But, uh, but to your point, uh, absolutely it's got room and uh, we need to, to really give that a good push. Whatever they were doing at NATO, uh, we haven't heard anything, but uh, let's see what they come up with. But you know, the, that question also mentions the innovation. This is where we need to bring in you know, the startups, uh, the companies that actually can help you with indicators uh, yeah. and uh, make actually skip through the, the silos of bureaucracy. Uh, of the decision-making um, um, cycles, be it in the, uh, in the national governments or in international organizations. I mean, NATO has been doing a lot of work on that, but I think we need to be much, much faster. I think Deborah also has a real important point. When you look at where the Ukrainians have been using drones, mm -hmm. the way they've been applying the intelligence we provided them, uh, the way they've been handling electronic warfare challenges from, from, from Russia, they are a driver of innovation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know firsthand that our armed forces are just sucking down the lessons learned. And that to me taps my hat to the Ukrainians, but also makes me want to be bringing more into the alliance because they bring so much real value. Yeah. Let me turn to an issue that's kind of out of area, and that's the Indo-Pacific. I'm looking at, um, at, at Robin here. You know, at the Bucharest uh, ministerial last week, meeting of NATO for foreign ministers in Bucharest, of course, it was a big focus on what more can be done to help Ukraine, help it weather through the winter and that sort of thing. But the United States also very gently pushed forward an important and emerging debate on NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific. And this, of course, is driven, I think, by U.S. concerns about China's increasingly assertive posture. Can NATO handle both the challenges of the eastern flank and a more significant role in the Indo-Pacific? And what is the United States thinking about that role? What, what is it envisioning? And I, I'll get to what this means for Central Europe, but I'm interested in what's, the, what's going on in the Indo-Pacific yeah. for NATO? What's the United States pushing the alliance into? So I think there are two important points here. The first is that NATO isn't going to the Indo-Pacific so much as China, PRC, has come into NATO, into Europe, into North America, Neighborhood. into our systems, into our cyber systems, yeah. into our information systems, into... So the PRC has come to us, and that requires NATO to be clear-eyed and, and strategic about the risks and the challenges. And I, and I think the Madrid summit was a good first step in putting China into the strategic concept, and I think now the question is for all of us, all of us members of the alliance is, then what do we do? I also think having the um, our, our Indo-Pacific partners at the last NATO summit was very important, and I think we need to do that again and continue to have them in the conversation. And it showed that they have similar concerns. So I think across the spectrum, and it's not just military, <coughs> it's like I said, it's in the other realms cyber information, we, we have to make sure that NATO is looking at that strategically. And one last word on Ukrainian innovation, because I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Tori Newland was just in Ukraine over the weekend. I was there three, three weeks ago with Karen Donfried. And I have to say that the team at the State Department that covers Ukraine, that knows Ukrainians, like the Ukraine experts, our team, they are some of the few people in policy circles around Washington, who when everyone else was saying, when Kyiv falls, when Kyiv falls, they were saying, absolutely not going to happen because of their resilience, their bravery, and their innovation. And it's not just their innovation uh, on what they're doing technolo te technology-wise with some of the equipment they've received, but also their, they've shown amazing ability to be trained quickly on systems and then use those systems with incredible effectiveness. I mean, the rate of how, what they're shooting, how they're shooting down the incoming missiles is incredible. So this is really an armed forces that I think is going to be uh, indicative of, how, you know, like you said, it's going to be something we're going to be for looking at in the future. You know, I, I'd just like to pitch in and say we ought to tip our hat to Zelensky himself. And I yeah. say that because, you know, there wasn't a lot of faith in him at the very beginning. They felt that, you know, like happened in Kabul, he'd be on a plane out of Kiev, you know, and that's what... You remember what he Putin. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but what really turned for a lot of people was when he stood in the street with his cabinet among the rubble, as I remember, of, of yep. and he said, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, you know, I we're staying weapons, here. I need weapons, not a ride out. What's that? He said, I need weapons, not a ride out. Right, exactly. yeah, I'd send I me ammunition. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's, I think, what really turned everyone to, because we had just gone through Kabul. Ashraf Ghani, you know, uh, and so, uh, and, and, you know, Putin's assumption that that was going to happen again was wrong, and Zelensky, summoning the actor deep in him, he stood there and said, I'm not leaving, 
And that really inspired a lot of people. So I think we have to also give him a lot of credit himself uh, for helping to get the West standing behind Ukraine. Yeah. Yep. On China, if, we, if I can go back to that, I mean, for, for many years, um, and we can learn a lesson actually from what we're seeing in Ukraine, for many years, a bunch of allies have been saying, Russia is a problem. Uh, it's not going to be nice in the future. Uh, we're not happy that we can now say we told you so. But in fact, uh, I see a parallel in what the United States, States have been doing vis-a-vis -vis China. I mean, they're effectively and essentially saying the same, that China in the future will be a problem not only for the United States, but for the whole transatlantic alliance. And you know, we all know that China is watching uh, our response uh, to the conflict in Ukraine. But again, it's the same uh, discussion like we had with Russia. There is certain political, economic dependency uh, by some allies on China, some are more dependent than others. Uh, and uh, the debate that we're talking about, about Indo-Pacific, I'm only hoping that finally after many years we are moving away from this simplistic uh, image of NATO suddenly sending vessels and, uh, and uh, military stuff to uh, Indo-Pacific because there is much more we can do on the political level, on the technological level, and I think that's, that's at least the Czech Republic's understanding of where the United States is coming from. And one thing we haven't touched on is the accession, upcoming accession of Sweden and Finland into NATO, which could have profound effects on, on the security of NATO, NATO's eastern flank. What should we be expecting from those two countries, particularly in their relationships with Central and Eastern Europe, as they accede into the alliance? Talk, talk with Robert. So, so uh, I, I think that the biggest uh, agent uh, for the membership of uh, Finland and Sweden was Putin. Nobody pushed so close, uh, <laughs> close uh, Finland and Sweden as, 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 as Vladimir Putin. I think it will strengthen the alliance. They're feeling the same threat from the north as we are feeling from the east. And I think there will, uh, you will see a lot of cooperation between the countries of, of uh, uh, the, the Baltics, Nordics, and, and, and Central Europe. And when you count the number of countries also in the EU, this will have an effect on the European politics as well, quite, uh, quite substantially. So I think the leadership of these small countries, maybe that have been on the periphery, will be very substantial. And here is the, the opportunity today uh, to the United States and Great Britain to play a more important role in the transatlantic relations together with these countries. But what should we be asking them, what should we be asking them and Central Europeans to do together to operationalize the value of, uh, of, of, of this NATO next phase of NATO enlargement. I mean, everyone talks about the Baltic Sea now becoming a NATO lake. Well, it doesn't become a NATO lake unless the Central Europeans on one side and the Finns and the Swedes on the other do something together. What should we be expecting of them? Hmm. Jim? Uh, well, you know, I, I think I've worked with Swedes and Finns for so long. I think they're going to uh, determine what that role is based on what NATO is going to ask them to do, you know, as NATO eventually will suggest things for them to do. I think. Uh, I think we will see them more involved in the Baltic uh, and maybe with some forces in the uh, enhanced uh, presence there. But I, there's another area we're going to see, I think, the, uh, those two countries helping us out a lot, and that's the intellectual capital they're going to bring to NATO. I mean, NATO's got a lot of intellectual capital. They want more than intellectual capital. I mean, they're going to give them pass. Well, you know, around the knack when there's a problem or when there needs to be something negotiated that's got everyone locked up, uh, when there needs to be looking into the future uh, and trying to figure out where NATO needs to go, having Finns and Swedes around that table will be a great plus. I agree. Uh, you know, they bring uh, with them a very a great savvy in terms of European politics, in terms of Russia, in terms of transatlantic relations, all the things that you need to have, uh, you know, as part of your vocabulary when you sit around the table at the NAC, those two nations are going to bring. Uh, and that's going to really help us out a lot. Uh, uh, you know, that's what gets you out of trouble, is having people around that table who help provide leadership to NATO and help us go in the direction that we need to go in. So I'm not so, they're going to they're gonna do a great job, whether it's with the Baltic focus or an Arctic focus too, but it's where, it's around the table that I'm really looking forward to seeing their contribution. They've realized that NATO membership comes with responsibility. They've been part of our external planning process partnership for many, many years. And in fact, we've relied upon them in some of our plans. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this will go beyond that. I mean, I'm, when I think of Finland, I think of uh, a gateway to resilience, you know, the integration of a uh, whole society approach to all things security, right. uh, including uh, within the military system and the defense system. And I think we have a long way to go and learn a lot uh, from Finland and Sweden, for instance. Mm -hmm.
I'm surprised none of you are talking about call, encouraging the Swedes or the Finns to contribute to NATO EFP battalions to, you know, leveraging well, their air defense networks no, across they, the they Baltic. Will. No, I, they will, and I could have gone through all that. Yes. Uh, they, they will. Uh, but I think what they're doing right now is instead of leaping into something, they are, I think they've, they're, they're testing the waters right now on what's needed in the Baltic area. Uh, are Swedish ground forces needed in one of those of the three countries or Finnish? Air defense for sure, and they've been mm -hmm. talking about that as well. But I think what they're doing is they're sitting back uh, uh, and, and, and testing the waters and seeing what does NATO want them to do? What does Brunson want them to do or shape? You know, uh, what is it that uh, the regional uh, nations there feel is a real gaping hole that, that these two nations can fill? So I think they're doing the right thing and that they're going around talking to us. Uh, Ian, you and I have had a, more than one conversation with them on these kinds of things. They're, they're talking to the NATO military authorities, Second Fleet, you know, down in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, information gathering that they need to do before they jump into providing forces. But I think once they see where they need to go, there's no doubt in my mind they'll go and they'll bring quality with them. I've got one question more that I lost here on the, on, on the, on the screen, but it reflected Defense, our defense industrial base as a consequence, what, what's been reflected about it um, based on our difficulties with stockpiles. Yeah. Are there any specific steps that we ought to be taking now to strengthen the alliance's defense industrial base that could make it better prepared for a situation like this or a more demanding situation uh, in, in, in the future? Jan? Well, you know, uh, looking at the situation right now, what's happening, uh, allies have been providing uh, the equipment to Ukraine. In many cases, finally, we're getting rid of the Soviet legacy equipment, something mm. we've been talking about for the past... Uh, uh, 30 years. 30, I was going <laughs> to say 15. Um, uh, and that creates a capability gap and a requirement for additional technology, which can be backfilled by uh, allies who have not only the existing stocks, but also the production uh, capacity, which is much larger. Of course, in order to revive that production capacity, you also need to adjust uh, your internal acquisition systems, and you need to make sure that uh, the governments are able to do contracts real fast, uh, and uh, uh, that the, um, the requirement uh, for these industrial cooperation and these contracts are actually coordinated within, uh, within NATO. Uh, and again, I think a number of steps have been really uh, taken in that direction as a part of the Ukraine defense uh, group, uh, as a NATO on the CNAT level. Uh, a lot can be done in coordination with the European Union as well, which has already a lot of mechanisms uh, towards that end. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little optimistic. The problem is that, uh, you know, we're lagging behind. I mean, for many years, we've been sort of uh, not counting on the future defense needs, and we've um, downsized our, the capacity mm -hmm. of our industry. Including in the U.S. I mean, that's, this is the one thing that I worry about at night most, is this industrial aspect. Uh, we've got a lot of holes to fill. As I said, this basic is ammunition, 155 millimeter ammunition. Uh, how can we do this in a way that's not slow? And that's my fear is that the CNAD is working on this and the NIAG, both of those uh, within the alliance. And uh, so we know they're talking about it, but that that's going to take a long time. And we're never going to get it 100%. The, yeah. the toughest problems are be between... Uh, defense uh, industries and the defense industrial base, it's really hard. I mean, it's hard just in the United States to get it right. Now we want to try to coordinate what Europe is doing with what the United States is doing. I, my worry is we're going to think about it so much that it's going to we're, we're come up with some Rube Goldberg-designed procurement system, uh, and it'll be 10 years too late and be too expensive, and, and it won't deliver on time. That's my great fear. So uh, if I may just react, this is an opportunity to, to even boost the the heritage of the Czech and Slovak defense industry, which right. historically mm -hmm. has been very strong. And I think there is still a lot of, a lot of um, uh, people and talents. And, and I think this is the opportunity to work together also with the US defense industry and, and, and to utilize uh, the defense industry that is there in the Eastern <coughs> Europe. And NATO needs to pull it together. And NATO EU yeah. need to pull it together. But then me, you just grab your head. <laughs> and go. Let me close with, 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 with Robin, lo looking forward, because we had our Madrid summit, which had a big focus, of course, Central and Eastern Europe, brigades, new defense deterrence co concept and such. Now we're heading towards Vilnius. What are you looking, and, and I know from my time in government working with Jim, you know, organization like the State Department, Department, you're starting already now for your planning. Figuring not just where it is, because that's already decided, what's going to be the agenda, what are going to be the deliverables. What's in the back of your head? What's under consideration to define Vilnius 2023? 
Well, I think we've touched on several of the core elements over the course of the last hour, including this one, which is investment in, in our own defenses here in every NATO country. So looking at the Wales Pledge and looking at what, what countries really do need to invest and commit to. Um, and I, I agree. I think you know Wales is probably going to be a minimum going forward, and, and we're going to be all required to take a hard look at doing more. Um, I think, again, we've talked about this a little bit, but the role of Ukraine and how we how NATO and Ukraine, NATO at 32, hopefully. So um, welcoming Sweden and Finland, I hope, will be one. And then NATO at 32, making decisions about investment. And there are a lot of other issues. I mean, I think Secretary General will probably be up, and so that will be a conversation. There are a lot of other issues. But I think this war has certainly made the alliance more than ever clear on where the threats are and clear on how the alliance needs to be unified in addressing the threats. And so I think Vilnius, there is a lot of opportunity for us. Great. Well, let me close there, because we've kind of already crossed over our time. I'm going to thank our distinguished panelists here, Robert, uh, Robin, Jan, Jim, for, for, for your time and insights. And uh, thank you. And I'm going to turn over now to our, to our next uh, uh, phase, which is uh, remarks by Ambassador Miroslav Stasek of the Czech Embassy, the chief of mission there. Uh, he just arrived here last September, uh, coming at, back, coming from, pr from Prague as the uh, d Deputy Foreign Minister, a position I think he held for what, some six years. Yeah. And you bring a lot of experience, particularly in the Middle East, but uh, we really enjoy your presence here and all you're bringing to the U.S.-Czech relationship. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to the Atlantic Council to, to take this initiative and to organize the, the week uh, uh, focus on the collaboration uh, uh, with the Central European countries. Uh, I think it's uh, very important to, to have such an event in the time when the Europe is facing the most probably the most, uh, uh, most critical period since the Second World War. Uh, because uh, uh, I, on the other side, I'm also very much proud that uh, when uh, the, the uh, Russian aggression to Ukraine on 24th of February uh, started, uh, the Central European uh, countries were the first one to take the action. It means uh, the, the leaders of the Czech, uh, Polish, uh, Slovenian government went immediately uh, two weeks after the conflict to uh, to, to Kiev and the Russian forces were just 60 kilometers away just to, to show the political support to the Ukrainian government, but also another side uh, to, to, to ask what is needed uh, for Ukrainians. And uh, uh, I think um, the situation we are facing now just uh, confirming uh, how important the decision was to, to bring uh, Central European countries uh, 23 years ago uh, to to, to do the NATO and to, back the, to, to, be, to become the fledged uh, members, full members of, the, of this group, because uh, uh, I couldn't imagine the situation that uh, this is, uh, this, uh, in 1999, this uh, didn't happen. Yeah. But um, at the same time, on the 1st of July, we, we took the over as the presidency of the uh, European Council. Uh, I must say it's, uh, again, it's a very challenging time, and uh, it was immediately uh, clear that uh, the most of the things uh, we will be, will be dealing with is the conflict in Ukraine and, of course, the side events and side effects of the, of the conflict. And uh, in the first stage, we, we receive uh, almost uh, 465,000 migrants. At the moment, we are having slightly over uh, three, uh, 330,000 migrants as well. But uh, due to the fact that the Russians uh, uh, bombed uh, almost 60% 60, 60 of the Ukrainian uh, energy facilities, uh, and uh, as the winter is approaching, we are expecting, we are expecting uh, uh, some another wave uh, of, uh, of migrants coming uh, coming to the Central Europe. Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, another very important side effect of the WU situation is the energy crisis. But uh, there are not only challenges, but we uh, see also opportunities on our side. It means one of the opportunities to finally cut off from the energy resources uh, from Russia, uh, to diversify more our, our, our system and uh, to, open, uh, to open the way for the, for the, let's say, the exports of LNG from the United States to, to our region. I am so pleased that uh, already two, two shipments from uh, uh, Louisiana, we got it, so it is on the way. It means, uh, I think, that uh, for upcoming winter, which is still mild in Europe, it will be quite, uh, I, I think, it will survivable, and uh, this delivery will basically cover 
almost one third of our, our needs uh, this coming uh, winter period. But uh, there are in other areas uh, we see huge opportunities in the future, like uh, collaboration in the field of nuclear. Uh, we'll be going uh, through the tender of, on uh, enlargement of uh, capacities uh, in the Dukovany nuclear power station in Czech Republic. We would like to also strengthen our collaboration and the joint research on the SMR. We are also searching for the collaboration in the renewable sources of energy where we are see definitely, definitely the future. Another window of opportunity which we see as the side effect of, of the conflict is, uh, is a complete modernization of our uh, army, army technologies and uh, army equipment in uh, Central European countries. It means uh, we already uh, announced it that our government uh, will be spending uh, in uh, 2024 over 2% of our GDP on, um, on uh, modernization of our equipment. It's a good opportunity uh, for the American companies to, to come up. Uh, there are already several of these we are, we are negotiating as well. It means those are the, the, the momentums which uh, basically uh, we would like to not, uh, not miss. But on our side, uh, Ukraine is not only challenge. Uh, I think the, uh, the Europe and the United States uh, are facing big challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. For instance, it means this is another area where I think uh, we, we should work together very, very closely and to work with like-minded countries to bring them our, on our side. And uh, the, the collaboration with the Indo-Pacific is not anymore about the connectivity, but more about the security issues, about the trade issues, etc. Another very important segment I would like to mention in the area for possible future collaboration is Africa, because I think we lost a lot of time uh, in Africa, uh, we underestimate the situation, I think, there. And for instance, the countries like China, uh, Saudi Arabia, and other countries are quite far uh, ahead of us. It means the uh, Africa, I see, is also a very important uh, player. Uh, and uh, whatever will happen in the, in the sub saharan Africa definitely has the influence, direct influence, what happening at least in the south of, uh, south of Europe. It means, just to conclude it, because you had so many prominent uh, speakers uh, today, uh, I was so pleased that we managed also our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Lepaski. We had uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Minister of Defense. Sasha Wondera was here at the for, for the first panel. But uh, what I would like to say that uh, uh, there is another opportunity, opportunity to strengthen the relation between EU and uh, United States and strengthening cooperation within the, within the NATO for, for future, for future uh, uh, challenges. And I think uh, uh, this is the only way how we can also uh, support the Ukrainian side and how we, ca how we can stick to the unite, uh, unity and support them financially and uh, military as well. This is the only way we can succeed and uh, to bring end of the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much and uh, I wish you so many uh, successful meetings during this upcoming, uh, upcoming week and uh, once again thank you very much to Atlantic Council that uh, uh, hosting us and uh, having us uh, together. Thank you.